The big issue. The big issue is live from our studios at number 11, Dr. Martin Loop in Adabraka in Accra. We are live on 97.3 City FM and also on City TV. My name is Salom Adunu. The show, as always, is live and interactive. You can join your, the show with your comments on our WhatsApp lines on radio 0549986996 and on TV. The WhatsApp line is 0550. 585832. This week has particularly been eventful. A number of important things have happened, and today we have a full plate with the right persons to dissect the matters and bring you insight and understanding. I'll be right back and introduce the issues and my guests to you. Don't go away. Yeah, welcome back to The Big Issue. My name is Salom Adunu. This morning, uh, we have three main issues on our plate we want to be looking at or discussing. Earlier in the week, the finance minister, in accordance with law, appeared before parliament to offer Ghanaians a review of the implementation of the budget he presented to the House earlier in the year. And indeed, he said that he was not there to ask for more money or to increase taxes. Also, a number of initiatives have been introduced, especially the one that has to do with job creation. Prior to this particular budget review, we had a lot about job creation. If you recall, at the, at the core of the fixed Ghana demo, which was botched earlier, was the issue of job creation. And the finance minister and a few others met them and promised that the review of the budget will have a lot uh, in store for the youth of the country. One million jobs have been promised. There's also an initiative to help uh, young or women entrepreneurs get about 20% of all government procurement and, and a number of things. Uh, we will delve into that with my guests you know, uh, um, soon. Also, we had one of the parliamentary disputes uh, disposed of the one with the Asin North constituency. Uh, the Honorable James Jechikwesing's election is being determined to be null and void. And so as we speak, that particular gentleman is no more a member of parliament, technically. And, and a by-election has actually been, and been declared uh, by the court. But of course, that will have to be done by the Electoral Commission. We will examine the merits of the case. We will look at the case in its entirety and see where really the chips will fall. Indeed, the NDC has indicated that they will appeal the decision and are filing or have filed a stay of execution as far as that particular judgment is concerned. We'll look at that as well. And also, there is the big matter of the LGBT proposed bill. Eight members of parliament have sponsored a private member's bill uh, to criminalize or make stiff sanctions for persons known as the LGBT people. Uh, a lot is also being said about that. People think that it's unnecessary. Others think that we need to preserve our family values, etc. We'll look at those as well and see what the issues are with my guest. This morning, my guest will be Franklin Kujo, President of Imani Africa, um, the Honorable uh, George Kwekurikis Hagan, MP for 
uh, Cape Coast South constituency, also a former Deputy Minister for Finance and Trade and former Central Regional Minister. Uh, Dr. Vera Ogefiado, Senior Lecturer, Department of Finance at the University of Ghana Business School, and Solomon Ejei, who is Executive Director of the Ghana Startup Network. Part two of the program, which will deal with the Asin North constituency matter, will have Martin Pebu, who is Executive Director of the Human Rights and Governance Center, a private legal practitioner. Uh, Franklin Kuju, again, of the Imani Center for Policy and Education Africa. Uh, the Honorable Alex Ander Aban, a private legal practitioner, former Deputy Minister, and indeed a member of the MPP. We'll also have Nick Paku Samoa, a private legal practitioner and a member of the NDC. So this is how our plate looks like today. And so we will zoom straight into uh, the matters and provide some updates for you on what the finance minister has been saying uh, to the people of Ghana. And indeed, uh, on behalf of government, he presented a 2021 media budget review to parliament stressing that there would be no new taxes. The minister was emphatic. He wasn't asking for supplementary budget, stressing uh, he is staying within the limits of the appropriations approved in March uh, for the year 2021. Let's take a look at some of the highlights and also take some reactions uh, on this particular budget review. The Minister for Finance, Ken Ofoyata, at the outset of the presentation indicated that government would not raise new taxes and request additional financing from Parliament for the 2021 financial year. Mr. Speaker, this media fiscal policy review that I'm presenting does not come with a supplementary budget. And our revised fiscal framework for 2021 is kept within the fiscal target of 9.5% of GDP. We are staying within the 2021 appropriation. <laughs> Respectful Mr. Speaker, let me repeat. I'm not here today to ask for more money. I have not come. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm not here today to ask for more money. I have not come. I have not come to ask for more taxes. <laughs> I have come to update the House on the performance of the economy for the first half of the year of 2021 and our plans for the unexpired term of the year consistent with Section 28 of the PFM Act. He indicated that government was within its fiscal targets for the year. The Ghana Statistical Service reports the overall GDP growth for first quarter 2021 was 3.1%. The growth was even better, excluding oil at 4.6%. The Bank of Ghana Composite Index of Economic Activity attested a strong growth recovery with the index growing at 33.1% at the end of May 2021, compared to a contraction of 10.23% at the end of May 2020. Mr. Speaker, on inflation, we are witnessing one of the lowest numbers on record in about two years. Inflation, which at the height of the pandemic, Hovered around 11.8 percent, dropped to 7.5 percent in May 2021, before inching up slightly to 7.8 percent in June. The Bank of Ghana will continue to implement appropriate monetary policy to maintain inflation rate within the target of 8 plus or minus 2 percent. The city has been relatively stable in the past four years and maintained its stability even in this pandemic year. For the first time. For the first time in the Fourth Republic, the exchange rate did not see a spike after an election year. Kenneth Foyata then outlined government's plans to create one million jobs over the next couple of years. One of the serious impacts, Mr. Speaker, of the COVID-19 pandemic has been the loss of jobs, which has exacerbated the unemployment problem, particularly among the youth. As such, government is ready with a comprehensive program to tackle this intractable problem. The goal is to create employment opportunities for a million of our young people over the next two and a half years by igniting, Mr. Speaker, a high spirit of entrepreneurship. We will count on the support of this August House for this. The Finance Minister also announced that government's Agenda 111 for the construction of hospitals across the country would commence on August 17th. 
The objective is to use the local teams comprising of Ghanaian consultants, project managers, and construction firms. It is envisaged that upon the successful completion of Agenda 111, Ghanaians across the country will experience a marked improvement in access to health care. Mr. Speaker, government and the project coordinating team have worked and tirelessly on phase one, and I'm happy to report that pre-contract works have been completed for 88 sites for the district hospitals. Mr. Speaker, we expect to commence phase two construction three weeks from now, from 17th August, 2021. Mr. Speaker, an important project such as Agenda 111 requires extensive preparation and due diligence. We are confident and happy with the level of detail and attention that has gone into the pre-contract works. The reactions will come in thick and fast, and the House will debate the statement up until the time it is passed by resolution. Reporting for City News from Parliament, my name is Trudman Sonko. The budget you read in March this year quite clearly made an attempt, and you will see that the figures coming from the Ghana Statistical Service seem to indicate that we are on a path of recovery. It means that the measures he put in place in March seems to be working. And he has quite clearly uh, read a budget, a review, which seeks to enhance, which seeks to complement the, uh, the measures he put in place in March and also trying to build on that. And thirdly, and finally, and most importantly, in my view, the finance minister came to parliament not to ask for a persua. He's not asking for a penny. No revenue measures, no increases in taxes, no increases in rates. He is not asking for any penny from the, from the parliament of our country, which is why the majority leader quite rightly put it, that we are not going to have a debate of what is presented, because he's not asking for money. Okay. If he was asking for money, then there will be a debate and there will be a, a, a vote or there will, there will be a resolution to approve the request he's making to the parliament or not. But he's not doing that. But finally... There is also the part where the finance minister seems to be emphasizing on youth employment, which is why, as the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, I'm particularly excited that he's approved the proposal we took to cabinet. The government has approved it, and the government is going to fund the National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program for Illegal Miners. So we are going to, we are going to have a robust, strong intervention to create jobs for illegal miners who are falling out of the cracks. We recognize that we have to sanitize the small-scale mining enclave and, create, uh, and make sure that uh, in the process we protect the environment of our country. But we also appreciate that some people will lose jobs and some people will fall out of the cracks. Do you not need money to run this program? He's done a lot of engineering within the envelope he has. Well, he has no money at all to actually dig, that's why. He's going to get money from other sources, but he's not going to take, uh, raise money by burdening you and I with extra taxes. Okay. That is the mark of a, a finance minister whom, with the greatest of us, has a thinking cap and thinking outside the box. Okay. And I am very happy about this budget. We should have cut down some of the taxes that are already there. So we could say that, well, this is a hallmark of a minister that is progressive. But it comes to say that things remain as they are. And things are really hard. That's why people are asking for the country to be fixed. It means it's leaving the normal. Nothing has reduced. Nothing has improved. No, no. We are not going to be in a status quo ante at all. He's not asking for extra taxes, no revenue measures, but he's spending more. You, you heard him quite rightly. The program that I put before him, which the government has approved, which we are going to roll out to create employment for illegal miners, that program is going to cost us a, 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 whole, a whole lot of money. And yet the finance minister is not increasing taxes. It is just thinking outside the box and being innovative and recognizing the challenges and difficulties of all of us Ghanaians, which was not brought about by the government of President Akufuado. This is something that is happening across the world in arising out of the pandemic. Economies are folding up. Economies are on their knees. People are losing their jobs. People are losing their livelihoods. And like the finance minister said, sometime last year, the president did made all kinds of interventions in free water, free electricity, we have free education. In spite of all of that, he's still not coming to parliament to ask for a penny, and yet he's seeking to spend more. So Thank you. we're going to work hard at it. Thank you so much. That's Samuel Abdullahi Jinapo. He's member of parliament for Damango and uh, minister for lands and natural uh, resources. Uh, the reactions are coming through.
uh, on the budget uh, review or the media budget review that has been presented by the Minister for Finance, Ken Oforiata. But so let's just get some quick reactions from the minority side. Kezala Tufosin uh, was in the capacity as a Minister of Finance. He has seen the Minister present the budget estimates today, well, uh, the uh, mid-year budget review, which is a bit curious. He's not asking for money. Honourable Member of Parliament, your reaction to this presentation by the Minister? The, the, the media review, excuse me to say that, is hopeless. Hopeless in the sense that it doesn't seek to solve the problems of the country. Sadly, our economy is in a bad way. And I was thinking that our minister responsible for finance would have announced strong policy statement in the media review that would seek to address the risk and the vulnerabilities in the system. Unfortunately, I've already read cover to cover. I do not see anything in the, in the media review that seeks to address the death situation that we have. I am not convinced that the problems that we face in the economy, this media review is going to address it. I think it's a lost opportunity, and I would have thought that our minister, working with the president and the cabinet, would have come together, by the bullet, and deal with the situation that we have. I was at a loss, only for me to see that in the first six months of the year, in the first six months of the year, huh, Almost every single tax item, revenue tax measure, is underperforming. In fact, tax revenue is underperforming by 1% of GDP. The program was that they should have done 7.5% of GDP. As we speak, they are doing 6.5. So what would, be the, what would have been the response? The response is that cut your tax revenue projections. They did not cut it. They've kept it as it's supposed to be. I have a problem. Then on the back of expenditure, in as much as I have seen that certain expenditure items are going up, I did not expect that goods and services alone should have gone up almost by 100% within the first six months of the year. So government is spending, but spending it in, on areas that are for consumption. I take strong exception to that. I don't know why goods and services that you projected, uh, an amount of about uh, 2 point something billion has all of a sudden jumped to uh, 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 4 point something billion. That for me is not acceptable. Well, so that was uh, some uh, summary of what transpired in Parliament earlier in the week. Uh, Finance Minister presenting his media budget review, and you saw some reactions there as well. Um, as it has always, you know, being the the side presenting the budget would think is the best thing to have happened to the country in the period, and the other side would think that it's it's been hopeless, like. Uh, the Honorable Atu Fosin has said. I want to get back into the studio and begin the discussion. Uh, I guess uh, the former Deputy Finance Minister and former Minister for Central Region, uh, the Honorable uh, Brickett Hagan, uh, Martin Pebu, uh, private legal practitioner, has joined me. A few others are on Zoom. Dr. Vera Ogafiado, Senior Lecturer at the Department of Finance, University of Ghana Business School, and Solomon Ajay, Executive Director of Ghana Startup Network. Gentlemen, you're welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll start with you, um, the Honourable, because you, you've been in a similar situation before where you, you, you were part of the key persons managing the economy of this country and you were part of the team that presented a number of budgets. Um, what are your initial thoughts on this particular budget? For the first time in many years, a finance minister has come into the House or came to the people of Ghana. He did not ask for taxes. Um, um, he did not ask for extra you know, uh, um, revenue or money from the people of Ghana. That surely should be something we should be happy about, given the difficult situation that the COVID-19 has put all of us. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, good morning to your viewers and uh, my colleagues on the, on the panel. Um, I'm sure we had you know, some of the comments that, that, that came from the minority side, which I subscribe to. But first of all, you look at when the finance minister came and said he doesn't want any, there's no supplementary budget. You know, he's sticking to the appropriation. 
He's not asking for any, no money, no tax, mm -hmm. as you have, you know, just mentioned that that's a good thing. Of course, all these things are meant to excite you. Mm -hmm. But then at the end of the day, there's nothing to write home about. You come to parliament mm -hmm. and basically say you are not asking for any more money. Actually, parliament doesn't give any money to the finance ministry. We give you an approval to go and look for money. The finance minister has realized that finding money, uh -huh. it's uh, going to be a tough, tough act. Uh -huh. Because we have borrowed to the hilt, and even the people who lend us money are telling us that, please put the brakes on. As we recently had a, a World Bank uh, president telling us that, look, we are borrowing too much and we should be careful. You would have thought that these are people who benefit from lending money to us mm. and obviously make some profit. So if your lender is actually telling you that, I'm probably not going to lend you any more money because you know your debt levels are really high, then you must pay attention. Secondly, we have also taxed people to the hills now that under the current climate, as you rightly said, it will be difficult and acceptable, yeah, uh, unacceptable for the Ghanaian people to accept any new taxes in an economy that is already on its knees and that people are really struggling and the hardship is actually real with prices and basically everything. Mm -hmm. So he came to the house knowing that he cannot actually find any money and that there was no point in actually asking for any money. Because we, 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 our job is very simple. If we are convinced by what he's telling us, we can give him the approval. But he has to go out there and look for money. And as you rightly said, I've been there and I know how difficult these things are. So that is the situation we find ourselves in. Now, the question then becomes, so I, again, the idea is don't get excited. Mm. This is supposed to excite you because all the things you hear sound good. But at the end of the day, you realize that there are some serious challenges here. Mm. Now, when you basically look at any budget, and if you just want to break it down, Basically, you, you set up your expenditure program and you are supposed to raise some revenue from taxes and all other revenues to basically fund those programs. Now, the difference, which is usually that you don't have enough money to fund it, becomes your deficit. And that is what we approve for you to go out and look for money like stuff like borrowing. We have borrowed so much, but yet we have very little to show for it. And the programs that we have spent money on in the last four years, they are in the fifth year now, have not really yielded the desired result. Like what? And first of all, I'll come to that. Mm. To whom much is given, much is also expected. Mm -hmm. It is clear that this government has borrowed more money than any government in the past, or even all of them combined. Mm. Now, we have done planting for food and jobs, and we are supposed to be able to basically reduce the unemployment or create more jobs through that program. That hasn't happened, and I will show you that. But, but a, lot of job, a lot of jobs have been created especially from, from the planting for food and jobs arena. Uh, uh, a lot of young people are going into farming. Yeah, they have on, seeds, they have fertilizer. Don't get excited. This is the excitement this media review is trying to, you know, get you to be excited. But there's nothing much to be excited. I, I just said, to whom much is given, mm. much is expected. If you look at the volume of borrowing that we have done mm. and the returns in terms of investing these loans, has given us, it obviously tells you that not much has happened. Now, and, and I, will, I will give you a, 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 some, something to prove it. You come to the second one, 1D1F, which is also one of the flagship program. This, they will tell you, 323 
companies or factories are in various stages of completion, 80-something factories are all working. All these factories are supposed to have cre you know, created some jobs. Now, you don't see the jobs there too. Now, come to the third one, where the government says that they have absorbed about 100,000 of graduates mm -hmm. into NAPCO. Again, you look at the impact on youth unemployment, and you realize that it hasn't actually got much impact. Now, let me just first of all, and I can pass this on to you to have a look, and mm -hmm. our viewers can actually see it. Okay. This is a graph I pulled out of ILO, that mm -hmm. is the International Labor Organization. This was not a graph plotted by the, the NDC or as the minority, which basically tells you the youth unemployment rate in Ghana from 1999 to mm -hmm. 2019. This is very important because everything else about this media review and even the budget was blamed on the COVID. Mm -hmm. So we've just taken the 2020 out, which obviously is COVID. So if things did not happen, it can easily be blamed. This is pre-COVID, mm -hmm. okay? And you realize that youth unemployment was actually up, which obviously means that jobs were not being created for the youth if it's going up. That's the unemployment. Jobs were created, but maybe not in the numbers to match. Absolutely. The, the, that's that's the, the point I'm trying people. to make. This is our um, second term of Kufo, mm. okay, which is around 2006 all the way to 2015 where it peaked. Mm. That is a higher youth unemployment. In 2015, when the NDC government was in power, it started coming down. So mm. there were some, you know, um, some if, of the if, impact. If, if you can turn that so that our viewers yeah, yeah. will also have okay, a look sure. at it. Mm -hmm. So basically, what this tells you is the Kufo's time where the rate of unemployment, as you can see, was going up, mm -hmm. meaning that yes. not jobs, mm -hmm. not many jobs are created. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when you come to the peak, mm -hmm. this is, as I said, 2015, when it peaked, when youth unemployment peaked. Yeah, youth unemployment peaked, mm -hmm. which means that basically we the have not created. So far. Yes, highest so far. It started coming down. Mm. And in 2017, when NDC government handed over, you can actually see that you have a flat curve here from 2017 to 2019. And as I said, 2020 is not part of this because anything you say on the 2020 will be under the pandemic. Now, even though you can see that marginally, there was a change from 8.84, which the NDC left, mm. to 8.72, which is just a marginal drop, which means that some jobs were created marginally. This is what statisticians and economists will tell you, a flat curve, mm. basically, which obviously means that it got static. Jobs were not being created for the youth though it did not sort of a, it did not go back up. So with all the spending that they've done for food, you know, um, for jobs and all that, for the 1D1F, one one for the 100,000 people that were absorbed, not much has actually happened up until 2019. Mm. So let's skip uh, 20, 20. 20, 20. Because that's a COVID year. Because that's a COVID year, which everything is being put on the COVID. Mm -hmm. That clearly tells you that actually, and, and when you look at other economic indicators mm -hmm. before the COVID, it tells you that the Ghana economy, if I can put it in medical terms, as, as, as we are describing the economy now on the COVID, was actually on some kind of a life support machine. Mm -hmm. If you try to draw an analogy on the health side of things, medical doctors will tell you, or medical scientists will tell you, that COVID affected people severely, and these are people with some kind of underlying conditions. Medical condition. conditions yeah. And they are the ones who suffered, who, who suffered or some of them uh, unfortunately actually passed on. There were people who were healthy and also mm. got the COVID and passed on. But if you look at the statistics, most people had underlying illness. When you translate that and bring it to economy, the economy itself 
had an underlying medical conditions. The underlying medical condition that some economists actually had already, and Ghana is actually one of them, or Ghana was one of them. Mm. You realize that the COVID coming in obviously took the oxygen out of the economy. Mm. That is why we suffered badly. The COVID affected every corner of the planet. Mm. Every corner of the planet suffered. Borrowing is gone up pretty much everywhere, deficits and everything. But when you put it in perspective and you look at it in relative terms, you realize that Ghana suffered more under COVID than even our neighboring countries. Mm. Our deficit in 2020, that's the COVID deficit, was about 16%. When you compare that to our neighbors, that is on the African continent, you realize that most of them were actually far, far, far low, though they, they had deficit, which was unusual, but it was, they were far better managed than ours. Mm. So that clearly tells you, if you segregate the two, that we had issues before that very thing happened. Now, again, you look at planting for food and, uh, and jobs. jobs. And we have been at this. Part of the borrowing that we have done in the last three or four years was to invest heavily in this area. Mm. And as you rightly mentioned, some people have got jobs there, some youth and all that. But you will expect that with the amount of money, borrowed money, that they have sunk into this area to basically get people to work, you would expect that that contribution will be much higher. I mean, I tell you, contribution yes, no, in I, terms I, of... I see you want to refer to document, but the, the question yeah. is, what were you actually expecting to see in this media budget review? Because obviously, from what you say, yeah. you, you were not expecting um, more taxes. You are not expecting that the, 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 the government or the minister would come and ask for a supplementary budget, which, yeah. which he didn't do. Yeah. What exactly were you expecting? He didn't come to have a tax, he didn't come to have a supplementary budget. What were you expecting to see that you did not see in this budget review? Well, what I'm expecting to see that I did not see is that the government was going to come up with programs that will stimulate the economy. Mm. Because at the end of the day, People would say, and, and we have said this in the past, that borrowing itself was not the issue. It's about what you borrow for. Mm -hmm. So when you have borrowed so much, our debt, as at the last, when the last budget was read, mm -hmm. was $291 billion. Six months down the road, our debt now sits at $334 billion. We have, in the last six months, added 40 billion Ghana cities in terms of our debt to our debt stock. Yeah, of course, the, the, the COVID has been blamed for it. Productivity is, is, is gone low. Government has to keep Absolutely. paying people. You know, Absolutely. government has to invest in medical supplies, Absolutely. a lot of things. So I think but, you need but, to put that in the context of that, the that's discussion. Why that's why I'm doing some segregation mm. by telling you that I've put pre-COVID and post-COVID, okay? And yes, you are right. Some of the debt is as a result of the COVID but what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that the government should not blame everything that is happening in our economy to the pandemic. Mm. Because the pandemic played a role in the challenges that we are having. But mm. we were already, fundamentally, the economy was actually having serious challenges before we got to that point. Mm. Now, the final point I'll make, I'll make on this, you know, before, you know, other people were coming, was that if you look at the level of debt that we have at the moment, which is obviously telling you that, you know, let's even, you know, forget about debt to, you know, GDP and all that, which looks quite astronomical. Mm -hmm. And IMF is telling us that we are now going to be about 84 percent by 2021 in the IMF Article, Article 4 consultation. Mm -hmm. So money that we have borrowed, which you have rightly said, to be able to get us back has not been used in that way. It's rather been used for purely consumption, but not things that will enable us to be able to pay back the monies that we have borrowed. Mm. And that is quite worrying. 
And the government has gone on as a result of their own various projects or things that they've talked about from manifesto right through to the budget. That's become quite challenging to do. Free education, all those things they've talked about, great. But when we look at the amount of money going into those areas, when people could have paid their own fees and others who could not, we would have supported them. We did it in a blanket way that has created a serious challenge in terms of education budget in our budget. We are spending about 55% of our tax revenue in just servicing our interest payment alone. Mm. When you put the debt servicing, which includes your interest payment and the principal together, you are doing about 72% of domestic, and that is frightening. Now, they talk about programs like care, you know, the about and pa. Mm -hmm. Great. About and pa came when they read the budget, and they told us that the about and pa, what they had actually made provision for in terms of the programs that they were going to do, the 100 billion, of which 30 billion will come from government and 70 will come from the private sector, as they put it. Now, when you are talking about the private sector here, again, the funding, we need to look at it. 30% maybe it's already been projected for in the budget or already been um, sort of a, they made an allocation for it. But the 70% they are talking about is going to come from the private sector. When they talk, and they are talking about FDIs. We don't control the FDIs, mm -hmm. okay? The FDIs are going up, but we don't control them. We don't control, um, we're talking about PPP. We have not done any significant PPP in this country for many years. So all of a sudden, PPP is going to fund us. We are yet to see. Now, the worrying thing about what I believe that, what the finance minister is saying that he doesn't need any more money, it's not exactly right is that when you look at this is about Tampa thing that they have produced when you go in here it tells you first of all what i've just talked about how would ghana care be funded that's what i've just talked about now here he says will ghana care lead to a job creation and they in 2021 budget when the finance minister came to tell us he said all these monies that they are going to use will help them create including youth employment, 400, which is what they have highlighted here, mm -hmm. 400... No, so, and, so, so oh, let's sorry. reference a document. Let, yeah. let's, what document are you quoting from? I, I'm Re quote, reference a document. I'm quoting from the Ghana Care or Batanpa program. Mm -hmm. this, that's what they have produced. And in that document, there's a section here that talks about would Ghana Care lead to job creation, mm -hmm. which is a question they have posed, and they have given an answer. In the answer... They have highlighted this particular line is being highlighted. That says that the program is targeted at creating mm -hmm. 420,000 productive and decent jobs mm -hmm. between 2021 and 2023, which is the same three years they are now telling us that they are going to be creating 1 million mm -hmm. jobs for the youth. Your problem with that is? My problem with that is, create, if we're going to create jobs, one, but which additional funding are you going to use to create these jobs over and above the 420,000 that you have already budgeted? So, 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 so your point is that the, uh, let's say, 680,000 extra jobs, jobs need to, to, to be funded to, to make the 1 million yeah. has not been captured Absolutely. anywhere, funding that's sources that's for that have been captured anywhere. They, that's what they've, they've, how, how about other GOG means? For example, we heard recently that clearance has been given to employ some over 11,000 people, for instance, into the security services. That is not about, about Tampa. We also know that about 280 or so 1D, 1F factories are at various levels of completion. When those things come on stream, they are going to employ quite a number of people. And other little, little, you know, uh, um, interventions, we, we have the, uh, what was the name? I mean, Maslog is there doing what it, it does. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, what was the name of uh, 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 this? 
uh, it got its name changed recently, and it was very okay. active. Yeah, it, it was very active during the COVID, yeah. giving loans to uh, uh, startups, etc. Yeah. You know, uh, Yangtze Aye also. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Kosi Yangtze Yankee Aye. I mean, her, her, her organization. Mm -hmm. They are doing things which are supposed to stimulate uh, some growth and create jobs. And I'm thinking that the estimate of one million perhaps is taking into consideration all those little little things mobbed up from various places to give the global one million figure. And of course, planting for food and jobs and all these things are already there. So they don't need to be captured as part of Obatampa or something that is newly be, be, being Absolutely. funded. Yeah. So I don't think the reference to the 420,000 and one million actually does adds anything to, to, to it because it, it there does. are programs it, already in place it does. to generate and, those numbers. Uh, it does, and let me explain that to you because you are missing a point here. You are just talking about government giving, um, what is it called, for, for them to be able to, you know, recruit more people. What does recruiting more people mean? It means that they have to be paid. Yes. Therefore, a provision, if that provision was not made in the budget, that provision needs to be made. And you've got to tell us where the money is going to come from. You can't just say, I'm going to pay people from the private sector. Because the jobs you're talking about, you're talking about government jobs being created. Very well. I don't know about you've been speaking for a while uh, yeah. uh, because you, you've been there before. Uh, let me also state that the MPP's uh, Issa Fuseni uh, will be joining us soon or is expected to join us any moment from now. Uh, we have three persons on Zoom. Um, let, me, let, me, let me deal with one of them before I come back to the studio to, to talk to senior counsel uh, Martin yeah, Kibu. Uh, Dr. Vera mm -hmm. Ogefiado is a senior lecturer mm -hmm. at the Department of <coughs> Finance, University of Ghana Business School. Um, hello, good morning, Doc. Uh, welcome to the big issue. Um, the yeah. NDC in the person, I mean, NDC's rep on the, on the, on the panel, uh, George Kuku Rekithagan, he said a number of things. Obviously not impressed with uh, the budget review as presented by the, uh, the, uh, by the finance minister. What are your own thoughts about this? It feels that government has borrowed so much, but there's very little to show for it. And I'm also saying that we need to look at the context. We are in a COVID situation, so things cannot be expected to be normal. He says that we've, we've, we've had, we've, our resources and we've had a lot more money within the period than, than, than any government in, in the past or everybody put together. What are your thoughts really on, on this budget and what were you expecting to see that you did not see and what excited you particularly about this budget? Though he cautions against being excited. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, when a budget typically is a representation of the roadmap for achieving whatever goals and objectives. So the goodness or the badness of a particular budget is based on the goals they set and therefore whether they're meeting them. So to actually be analyze whether the budget in and of itself is good, bad, exciting, then we may have to go back to the table and find out, okay, what were the objectives? And uh, the objectives truly in line with where we want to go and how we want to get there. And I believe that brings up a much more nuanced uh, set of discussions, which therefore means that it will be very difficult to just say that, okay, this is bad, this is great. Because when you go through, yes, at one point you realize that, yes, um, they fell short of revenue targets. But then, on the one hand, it appears that uh, we're able to make some savings. Now, Delving deeper might be real that we fell short of targets because we did not implement certain policies right. Now, getting there is the focus for me, usually from the uh, critical point of view, is what can we do to make it better? My focus is not really whether somebody is bad, good, ugly, because then it takes away the opportunity to learn for improvement because together we are seeking to make Ghana better. So. What we need to look at, or what I look at when I'm looking at these budgets to start with is, did we get our priorities right to start with? And of course, when you get to priorities, it also becomes another challenge as to what you should deal with first and what you should deal with later. So yes, um, the first speaker has speak spoken to a number of issues, has raised some dynamics here and there. I think that uh, to get the best out of this budget is to give it um, a relatively broader uh, should I say, perspective, looking at where did we say we're going, how were we planning to go there, and for that matter, is this particular budget uh, review document 
showing that truly we are on track? Or is it that we actually set out to go the wrong direction in the first place? So given where we are as a country now, the budget review that we have, and uh, why we set to, should I say, reach, don't really have any kind of congruence. So that, that for me, is, is a challenge. In terms of expectations, um, personally, I haven't had any unusual expectations for any government, particularly because COVID hasn't been very friendly. And I think it caught everybody unaware. So it will take quite a number of us and economies uh, quite a while to get back on track. And like um, the speaker rightly said, as a country, we've had our own issues through all the governments, all the um, previous governments. It has nothing to do with one particular government. So obviously, we've got structural problems that can actually exacerbate issues as and when they happen. And so it becomes very difficult to put the blame on somebody's doorstep. So more importantly, I think together we look at what needs to be done, how we can do it, and then propel the nation forward. I think for me, that's the, the angle from which I like to pick things. Uh, exactly the point. Uh, I mean, uh, many will say that it's important to look at how uh, the budget itself is being implemented to be able to make a, a, a good uh, prognosis of, of the future, and, and that's absolutely right. But um, what uh, initiative will you say uh, containing the budget that was just presented uh, uh, makes you confident that the future will, will, will be good. Of course, we have the one million job creation, uh, and the Honorable Rickett Higgins has said that no provision is being made for funding of, of the rest of the about 600,000 jobs. I mean, the difference from what uh, was, was advertised earlier or was published earlier, and that for him is, is an issue. Uh, do you get that sense, and do you think that the talk about the one million jobs for the youth, which is a critical part of everything we do these days is, is realistic. And, and, and what's your own thinking around that? Yeah, in fact, creating employment, and especially for the youth, is very important. And on one hand, if you look critically, we've always fallen short of our tax revenue. Uh, in fact, we've exceeded a target, but in reality, our tax revenue as a portion of the needed revenue to grow our economy has been woefully inadequate. Now, one of the main ways of getting the needed tax revenue would be to actually foster employment. So, yes, the need to foster employment is in the right direction. What I would love to see more of would be uh, sometimes a much clearer direction as to where government is looking to see these jobs being created as opposed to creating them themselves. Now, why I say that is because by giving that direction and making it that clear within the budget statements and sometimes within the review, it can actually provide uh, more like a, a stimulus or an indication to the private sector as to where they can align to be in tandem with the objectives and desires of government. So for me, even as I pick um, some information from the document that indicates that we want to expand and then want to create employment. I would have loved to see a bit more of the specificity in terms of where we want to go, where the focus is, what is our desire as a nation. For that matter, it may not necessarily be government creating the work or the jobs for that matter, but rather the private sector rising up because, okay, we know government is going east. So, okay, private sector entities that have an interest in going east, what can they do to carry government along because at the end of it all we can see from the very budget statement that the private sector is supposed to be at the heart of the growth drive so some clearer uh, details that will help the private sector to formulate strategies to help government attain its ultimate goals i think would help all of us in the long run all right so let, let me take a final one for you at least for this round they, 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 there's some initiative to um help women who are in business in terms of reserving 20 percent of all government procurement for women that, that that should make you happy being a woman but i'm not quite sure about how that is going to be implemented your thoughts on that okay so that's a gender-based budgeting and of course it ties in with the pursuit of sustainable development goals seeking to reduce the uh, inequality uh, to actually promote gender equality. Now, yes, it makes me happy. Um, in Ghana, I think the bigger challenge has been not necessarily not having good ideas. I think most of the other governments, 
both devices usually come up with some very good ideas. I think the challenge for us usually has been the implementation. So like, like you rightly said, we may want to get to the nitty gritty of what it would take to make implementation successful. So um, whilst we want to dedicate some amount of the money to focus on just women-led or women-owned businesses, one of the key things I've come across in my area of specialization is the fact that in as much as you're making the money available, one key thing is to equip the people with the skill sets or the capacity to manage the funding or the resources you're putting there, or you're making available to them. So um, if we look clearly at what would make implementation a success, I believe in the long run, yes, the, should I say the earmarking or the dedication of this percentage to just women-owned or women-based businesses is going to go a long way to grow us. But to a large extent, we have to get very serious with the implementation. And for that one, I think we need to get to the ground, gather some more data. So in a lot of other countries, you realize that to a large extent, getting these things done would mean some serious research will get in there, understand the dynamics at play within the space that you want to work in. Then you do the implementation. I think sometimes... Um, we do start the implementation before we realize that some of the parameters we assumed to be existing, for which reason we are based, you know, the assumptions we are basing our implementation efforts on do not really exist in the format or in the structure in which we expected them. And that makes for, you know, failed implementation plans, not because the ideas are bad, but because maybe we didn't get all the pillars right before we rolled out. That's what I can say. Very well. So, so we'll get back to you. Let, let me engage uh, Franklin Kujo, uh, who is the executive director of Imani Africa. Franklin, um, we've seen the, the review. We've heard what was said. But it appears not much was mentioned about efficiency. We talk about revenue generation and expenditure. In between that, uh, a few leakages here and there we've, we've always known over the years. It appears uh, that not much was said about uh, efficiency, how government intends to, uh, or what efficiency measures government was intending to uh, implement to ensure that the leakages were, were, were reduced. I don't know if you caught any. <clears throat> well, good morning to yourself. It's been a while. Good morning to uh, good friends in the studio and uh, Doc and Solomon. Um, that's a, an important question because, as you realize, uh, in spite of the goodwill that this government has courted for itself and also courted for the country, uh, which continues to lead to uh, significant investments into the country, um, I think the COVID expenditure pattern, if you like, the, the whole COVID management itself, um, reactions to it have been mixed, at, at least from the standpoint of accountability, uh, should I call it, entrepreneurs. And I think that's where the issues around efficiency or the management of these funds, and a lot of come in, by the way, droves. Uh, where the challenges are with this um, attempt to, if you like, rebalance the economy or set the economy back on its original footing. I don't think we've heard so much about the COVID expense. You know, I think there have been questions that have been asked. Um, the fallout of this Sputnik vaccine matter is just a tiny, more like, a, it's just one aspect of this whole question about the way the COVID expenditure pattern has been has been managed and i suspect when you ask the question not that i suspect actually when you ask the questions you are told that it's an ongoing uh, pandemic and so you probably do not need to have the full facts before you it makes it difficult therefore to support the government in its entirety when it then goes ahead to uh, as it were list some of these uh, interventions or or uh, yeah, interventions that they want to undertake, for which, for instance, we would need to have continued to pay almost nine additional taxes that have been introduced since uh, the pandemic. So it's a good question you've asked. I, I could also add the fact that even for the main projects, if you look at the planting for food and jobs, I mean, such a, an important project should not have uh, heralded the, the excuse that we had that uh, the project seems to be on uh, life support simply because of the, uh, the, the, the expected 
consequences uh, regard, regarding the distribution of fertilizers. Um, and I suspect that things of this nature, some of these flagship projects and the way they've been managed uh, could have accelerated our could have accelerated building our defenses against the onslaught of the pandemic. And I think that's what Honorable uh, Rikit Sagan is actually driving at. That there's been so much goodwill, there's been so much goodwill has come with a lot of money. Um, and, and, and it looks as if if we had been a little bit careful, we would have been able to build the resistance against the, the, the so-called continuous onslaught of the pandemic. Having said that, um, I've got to say that the economy obviously was started to be actually on the onset of this government's uh, administration. They told us that they were going to move from taxation to production. Mm -hmm. um, now, I understand that along the way, because before then, before the pandemic, we had some very good numbers, right? Uh, but along the way, uh, as the pandemic hit, one would have thought that, well, almost all the interventions we've been making should be leading us into, or should be taking us out of this quagma of taxation into a production process. So far, it looks as if we are marking steps. Marking steps not only because we've been overwhelmed by the pandemic, but only because we've managed to garner a lot more resources than most countries have, but have yet to see the full impact of these uh, interventions or the resources, the way they've been utilized. So that's what I like to stay on and say that we need to see a lot more, um, should I call it resolve, to ensure that the, the mantra of moving from taxation to production is not for the government entity itself, but for the productive citizenry. Uh, one can say that, yes, in the pandemic, governments seem to basically be at the command, at the height of the command, well, they command the economy. But we all know how, even before so, so, the so, pandemic, so Martin, the uh, sorry, uh, Franklin, I, I think I'll, I'll let you hold your thoughts. Let, yes, let, let me let you hold your thoughts there. Sorry? Let, let's, uh, can you hold your thoughts there? Let's take a quick break. Uh, TV will join us, you know, when, when we return so that you can continue uh, making your case. So this is the big issue uh, coming to you live from our studios at number 11, Dr. Martin Loop in Adabraka in Accra. Mm -hmm. We'll take a quick break. We'll return and Franklin Kujo will continue the point he was making. I'll bring in my other guest, Solomon Ejeo, who is executive director of the Ghana uh, Startup Network and uh, Martin Pebu, who is in the studio as well. Don't go away. You welcome back to the big issue. Uh, my name is Salom Adonu. We have just been discussing the media budget review. My guests in the studio include um, uh, Martin Pebu, private legal practitioner, uh, George Kweku Rikitegan, MP Kepo South, former Deputy Minister for Finance and Trade at a different time, and then also uh, former Minister for the Central Region, uh, Franklin Kujo, President of Imani Africa, Dr. Vera Ogifiado. Uh, Senior Lecturer, Department of Finance, Investor Ghana Business School, Solomon Eje, Executive Director of Ghana Startup Network. Uh, Franklin, um, you were making a point, but just quickly conclude on that point. And, and, and also, uh, the talk about formalizing the economy. We've seen a lot of things uh, being done, especially from the Vice President's side of things. But let us know if you think that these things being done and how the budget appears now, or the review at least appears now, we, we, we are moving steadily towards reaping those benefits because it appears we really need to do that as, as fast as possible to rope in the, the informal sector so that we can bolster our tax you know, revenue. You know, I've always thought about this conundrum, about the, the low, uh, if you like, efficiency performance of the taxation uh, authorities, in this case, the mantra that the quite a significant amount of people did not pay tax. Well, I may be bullish in my suggestion that you might probably want to re-engineer the taxation system we have because I'm not too sure that many people did not pay taxes. There are informal taxes. Sorry, there are the uh, what's it called? The consumption taxes. Um, indirect. indirect. Not direct taxes. Indirect the taxes. Indirect taxes that people pay. In the far 
eastern uh, com former communist eastern uh, what's it called blocks. Some countries like Estonia have managed to re-engineer their taxation system and ensure that the flag tax system was introduced. If we could do that for certain categories of uh, entrepreneurs, and it's been done before, I do not think that it's very difficult to undertake this holistic, if you like, a whole change in the taxation system, so that with a flatter tax and a lower tax band, a lot more people will be willing to pay. Don't forget, naturally, people do not want to pay taxes. So if you are, if you are, if you are setting up your whole taxation system based on uh, looking for people to pay direct taxes, and that, of course, maybe the taxes themselves are a bit higher because their productive uh, enterprises are not commensurate with the taxes they pay, then you continue to be in this hell hole. That, you, that definitely does not lead you to uh, bolster your tax efficiency collection, uh, should I say, I mean, process. So I've, I've been thinking that we should probably take a look at the taxation system and ask ourselves, what optimal tax systems do we want for the country? That's not to take away the, uh, take anything away from the initiatives that have been adopted, uh, the digitalization process, or the whole idea of making sure national identification numbers are now become, are now supposed to be the basis okay. for tax collection. Yes, you can do that, but <laughs> clearly speaking, if the capacities of the persons you are so you have so identified are not able to pay those direct taxes because of the uh, rates involved, then you might as well start rethinking your taxation model. And I think that's one of the things I, I, I like to suggest that we should take a critical look at. The whole idea of uh, these reforms actually yielding some fruits. Um, I always say that at the end of the day, because government seems to be the biggest spender and the biggest, more or less, investor in the economy, it looks to me, once we begin to look at the efficiency of government spending and its expenditure pattern, we may begin to, I'm sure we'll start unlocking the fruits of uh, ever like an equal field for everybody. And I'm saying this because procurement has been the biggest, you know, the, uh, the, should I say, block uh, blockade when it comes to how free government spending plans or government investment plans would eventually in your to our benefit. So if we throw in the fact that, well, you are going to undertake some procurement reform to ensure women are able to purchase uh, part of the procurement economy because you are giving them some concession, I say it doesn't go far enough. But the big ticket transformational uh, projects that are heralded, heralded by governments are all leading the procurement irregularities. And that's one of the things that this government also promised when it ceased, when it, when it took over from the Arsenal administration, that like for like, they were going to be better in terms of procurement than the previous administration. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not too sure we've seen a lot more difference than the previous one as well. So I think all in all, the interventions that are being undertaken um, needs to be anchored in efficiency themselves mm. uh, before we can begin to realize the fruits of the full digitalization enterprise. Look, we've done this digitalization even at the port, but I'm sure you know that because the the, the enterprise, uh, should I say, solution was not proper, there are still leakages at the port. And uh, trust me, I'm not too sure the, the uh, we have to believe everything the we are being told that because of the new systems at the, at the ports, it's raking in a lot more revenue. Mm -hmm. It's only because uh, cargo has increased and they've added revenue from the airports as well. So we need to start looking at exactly what these systems, however they are to the digitalization efforts, are actually benefiting us. If they are procured for, uh, badly, they will never give you the results that you need. Very well. Having said that, I, I think I'd like to uh, probably if, if end this round on, the, quickly, on yes, what yes. my good friend, the Minister of State for the Finance, Charles Adubain, stated yesterday. Yeah. That, look, it's going to be a tortuous road for the next year um, because of because there's no movement in the... In, there's not going to be any significant movement in terms of uh, relief in our lives, which is the reason why the Finance Minister stated that he's not coming to ask for any new money. 
or indeed making the demands of parliament. Um, I think it's important to have some soul searching and also realize that in, in spite of the fact that there's been a pandemic, Ghana has been blessed and we've received significant amounts of money whose uh, usage we are yet to see. Uh, I mean, I mean, the whole student usage we are yet to see. Very well. So, so on, on that note, let me bring in Solomon J, who, who is executive director of the Ghana Startup Network. Uh, many of the, the young entrepreneurs or startups have said that they are already reeling under the pressure of a lot of taxes. A number of taxes were introduced in the budget itself. Some others were amended. And uh, to hear that this particular budget was a bit low on reliefs for uh, young entrepreneurs, I mean, for a lot of them, they, 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 they said it was heartbreaking. Given where you sit, what is your own thinking around the fact that, I mean, uh, your people say that very, they've not seen a lot of reliefs for them um, in this particular budget review? Well, um, good morning. Good morning to you, Salom, and um, good morning to to the listeners and, of course, watchers, uh, viewers on, on TV. Um, again, good morning to the firm and fellow panelists, my senior colleagues, to Franklin Kukudu, who is a long-term friend. Um, I'm traveling, so pardon me if you, you see a bit of breaks in my presentation. Well, touching on the on the issue for the day, um, it's a welcoming news for most of us as startup entrepreneurs in the country, especially the, the issue of the youth bank, among other things, as were, were mentioned by the finance minister. But then the key question for, for some of us is that uh, why the need for the for the youth bank at this moment? Why the need for a youth bank at this moment? That is one key issue that that, that will have to be to be looked at. You know, and um, what gaps, what what gaps would this would this bank fill? What what gaps would this bank fill in terms of supporting youth enterprises in the country? And then again, we will have to look at the, the issue of why can't any of the, the current banks be empowered to 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 take up these roles in supporting the youth startups? across the country. And then again, you may have to also want to find out how would this bank, this youth bank, be financed in the first place? And then again, to proceed to ask how will it be managed after the bank has been set up? Now, what are the key issues when it comes to access to funding for, for youth businesses in the country? You keep hearing about the issue of collateral, okay, which is a major headache for most of us young people in terms of assessing funding for our businesses. Because I mean, if a young man do not have a house or a car or any any valuable asset to to use as a collateral for for a loan, you can't get any of these loan banks. I mean, uh, uh, banking loans. So the question is that um, how would this bank operate? This youth bank operate? What modalities will it put in place to ensure that the young man who does not have a car or a house or anything to use as a collateral can access? this funding or these loans that they need for their businesses, all right? Now, bank has to talk about the high risk of business failure, that if they give you the loan, they are not sure your business can, can stand the test of time, and they are not sure you can pay back all those things. Again, the question there is, how would this youth bank address that issue? Okay, what measures will be put in place to ensure that, um, that, that, that the young people can assess these loans with ease. Again, the process of getting loans is very hectic. What measures would they put in place to ensure that the young people can easily assess these loans? So this is not just the issue that, that has to be to be looked out for um, and see how best this bank will be will operate. So like, it wouldn't just be like a normal another normal bank that the young man has to go through a lot of headache and struggle before assessing a small money for their, their their businesses. Again, when 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 money is given to you, I mean, even before that, how will someone qualify to assess a loan? Um, will it be that I can present my business plan um, it be assessed, and based on the viability of it, I get that support that I need, or I need to still prove X, Y, Z to meet the basic requirement of getting the loan. So there are, there are many issues that, that need to be, to be to look at. But again, 
for us, I think it's a good thing that the government seems to understand the need of supporting startup businesses. It's a good thing that the government is, is understanding the need to, to make Ghana a startup nation. I mean, for instance, the, the initiative like the NEIP, um, initiative like the Ghana Enterprise uh, Agency, and among other ones, are supporting the youth businesses. And that is good. That is good. Um, the issue of youth unemployment is, is a very headache for all of us in this country and even beyond. I mean, talking now today, or actually yesterday, the NSS uh, for this year ended. I mean, it ended. Um, that means that thousands of youth are going to be on the street now looking for jobs. So when government talk about one million jobs for the youth, it's, it's, it's a good sign. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a welcoming news. But the question is, how will this be implemented? And who will be the beneficiaries of this job that will be created? OK, will it be for, for certain party trade foes or for certain family and friends? Or it will be open to anybody who qualifies for such positions or for such roles? So this is the thing that, that we, we, we need to look at. And um, for us, we want to make a recommendation that um, the government needs to have a conscious effort to make Ghana a startup nation. There must be a calculated effort to ensure that the young people with ideas can be able to start their business and run and operate successfully. You know, um, how are we supporting people now from the schools? People have ideas that they want to, to start from schools. How are we supporting them? Student entrepreneurship, how are we supporting them? Okay, I, I, one of the comments that the Prime Minister made was that uh, most people, I mean, most youth nowadays, to take up courses that are more like irrelevant to the labor market, which is true. For per risk, some of the things are very true. But the question is, what are we doing about it as a nation? Is it time to, to view these educational courses that we pursue in universities? Is it time to take certain ones off? Is it time to, to make available certain opportunities that will be, be directly linked to what they study in schools. Mm. So, I mean, once the course is there for them to study in school, you should start when they come out of school, they can be able to get something to do with it. Very so, well. if the government have realized that certain courses in schools nowadays do not have, I mean, uh, uh, you, you can't work with after school, what are you doing about it? Are you creating an avenue that ensures that those and that areas can get direct job to do? Or you will want to take off those courses out of the school so that they can study what will be, I mean, uh, what is labor ready for the market. Very so well. it goes beyond just saying it, all right? It goes beyond just saying it. We need to see results. We need to see how it should be implemented. We need to see how involving the young people on the ground will be involved to ensure that this, you know, things, as being said, will be fruitful to the benefit of everybody. Very well. You know, right. and again, um, we we trying to to propose that there must be like I mentioned a contract effort. We as a Ghana startup network, we are trying to at the moment we are at the stage of drafting a policy, a big bill for the for Parliament to pass become an ad, an ad that will will outline the frameworks for supporting startup businesses. V what very we call well. the Ghana so, so, startup innovation bill. V very well. So right. I I so I, I think the point we will... is that. I think we will deal with that, you know, maybe as the program grows or the program wears on. So let me bring in Martin Pebu, um, who has been listening. Your point about startup, uh, Ghana being a startup nation, it's, I think it's fantastic. And we would think that with the right support, this can, this can help deal with a lot of the uh, unemployment situation we, we have in the country. This which is where I bring in Martin Pebu. He also mentioned that yesterday, which is indeed true, uh, the national service regime for 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 2020, 2021 came to an end. Now you have a lot of these young people graduate from schools now pouring onto the streets looking for jobs. That sh surely poses a big issue for the country. Are, are you okay with the proposals in the budget in respect of dealing with this matter of unemployment? Well, let, let me say, to, uh, as a pragmatist, mm -hmm. okay, if only we can even raise funds for what we intend, that should be sufficient at mm -hmm. least for in the near, uh, I mean, uh, uh, term, okay? The point is this. You see that uh, Honorable uh, uh, Ricky Sagan showed the CARES program, okay? You're going to raise funds. This, and you heard Dr. Fiado mm -hmm. talking about implementation. Mm -hmm. So in all of this, the key thing is that will their plans come to fruition? So I want to be very pragmatic. 
if what we've outlined here, we can achieve that, that will be sufficient for now. Then we will escalate for mid uh, this term and then for a longer term future uh, projection. You see? Yeah. So let's just take this. Let's make sure if we can get the one million, that would be fantastic. Mm. But if you look at the fact that these are based on uh, what do you call it, finding funding, mm -hmm. then you are left wondering that hey, will funding come true? Mm -hmm. Will funding come true? Will everything go according to plan? Will the implementation be done well? You say, yes, so I would want to go with the finance minister, the youth bank thing, with uh, financing youth led startup businesses, as Solomon is referred to. That's in the uh, paragraph 112 of the, uh, yeah. the, the, the statement. The, the statement, yes. Yes, so he's made that clear. Okay. And then other paragraphs. So you see that in natural fact, from the beginning mm -hmm. to the end, every now and then he'll come back to youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. So you can see that this is really a problem that is affecting us. Mm -hmm. I mean, to put it mildly, because our statistics show that the youth, and in this case, they are defining youth as persons below 35, mm -hmm. they form about 71% of the population. Hmm. Okay, so if you have the youth forming about 71% of the population and most of these are unemployed, the natural fact has been said over and over that youth unemployment is a ticking time bomb that can explode and cost us so much that we've not dreamt about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you see in paragraph 40, he refers to it. The youth, um, yeah, so listen here, paragraph 40 he says, Our strategy is to place the private sector at the heart of this endeavor to accelerate competitive import substitution and export expansion mm -hmm. to generate sustainable jobs for our teaming youth, that's into brackets, under 35 years, who make up about 71% of the population. You see, so accelerate Competitive import substitution, uh, one district, uh, one, factory. one factory, and etc. <clears throat> okay, so you set up local factories. Make sure that these are sustainable jobs because I've seen in the literature in the past some professors have come up to say, even for them in labor economics, when you say job is not the same as an em uh, uh, employment, employment, you see. So I'm happy at least he's qualified it by saying sustainable jobs. That's to say, a job that will go for a long while, mm. that can keep livelihood. That can sustain livelihood, you see. Yeah, so from paragraph 40, as I said, you come back to 112 and so on, and you still find the Honorable Minister talking about youth unemployment. So for me, let's support, let's make sure that everything that has to be done will be done to make sure that it works. Because, and this is why I want to tie in. So you see that the previous uh, panelists from Franklin, Honorable, all of them have touched about leakages. Mm -hmm. I'm happy he's mentioned the issue of petroleum bankering. Mm -hmm. You know, Senor Hussein, yes. who is very I mean, uh, well known to this yes. program, has been on and on about petroleum bankering, the way people go away with billions, mm -hmm. okay, billions of Ghana cities. That's a lot of money. The last time they re released their annual report, see that they gave some very staggering figures about mm -hmm. people who are uh, circumventing the system and not paying taxes. So it's very heartwarming that the Honorable Minister has specifically mentioned it, that they are going to tackle it. So maybe they should be putting Senor Husi on the board to help. Uh -huh. So I'm interested here. <laughs> the <laughs> paragraph 31. <laughs> yes, his hands are already full, but I'm sure he can help. Yes, so let's get paragraph 31 here. For me, it touches me a lot. He says, our focus on taxes is to collect what is due the Republic. To this end, we are building a robust framework to expand domestic revenue mobilization to focus on compliance and enforcement nationwide. Mm. We have established the Revenue Assurance and Compliance Enforcement, into brackets, race. The remit of race is to identify and eliminate revenue leakages in areas such as petroleum bankering, mm -hmm. gold and minerals export, port operations, Franklin mentioned it, transit goods, warehousing, border controls, and free zones operations, to name but a few. Yes, so, I mean, it's good. It's on point. Of course, he handles the economy, mm -hmm. so he understands it far better than 
Yes, because you see, this issue of uh, people not being roped into the tax net has been there for ages. Mm -hmm. You hear this common uh, statistics that's usually thrown around. Uh, I mean, I hear it comes from GRE that about 6 million Ghanaians work and only about 1.5 million of us pay direct taxes. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Let's go back. About 6 million of us work mm -hmm. and we are talking about direct, direct taxes. taxes yeah. Yes, they, that's a pay as you earn. 6 million work and only about 1.5 pay. Yeah, that's not so good the enough. remaining 4.5, where are they? Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, it's good that the Honorable Minister is saying that, look, they are going to ramp up efforts to rope in these people. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so that if we rope in more of these people, and perhaps even reduce the threshold, mm -hmm. because, you see, the threshold, the, the figures, the, the, if you look at the income tax figures, yeah, those are the far higher end. Yeah, they complain to that the rates are too high. <sighs> Yeah, so if you rope in more people, then you can reduce. You then increase you, the base and, and, and the, the, the figure will, will go up. And the surprising thing about this thing is that, look, this thing about the, 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 the direct taxes, uh, millions of our people not pay, it's been here for over two decades. Yes. Every year you hear, we will expand the tax net, we will expand it. So, so, so perhaps the, the, the tax identification number, and now that the Ghana, the national ID numbers have become the tax identification numbers, perhaps. I think there's, there may be a plan to ensure that that ropes in a lot more people. Yeah. So maybe many yeah. more people can pay taxes. Let, let, we want to conclude on this round. Okay. Let, let me go to, before I come, you, Honorable, you will conclude. Uh, let me go to Dr. Fiado quickly on, on, on a GDP and, and recovery. People have said that the focus really should, should not be about the debt, but our thinking and focus should be around uh, recovery how we can survive, how we can get the economy expanded so that a lot of things will, will, will kick in and we'll, we'll get back to where we were pre-COVID. I don't know what really your thoughts are. When, when you look at the, the revenue envelope, for example, we have emoluments, uh, debt servicing, and statutory payment, etc., taking more than 90% of the revenue. And, and that really is, is a difficulty for any government in this particular pandemic. I don't know what your thoughts are on how the government must work to wriggle its way out of this difficulty. Also keeping its eye on the fact that the debt to GDP ratio is, is, is gone way up now around 77% or so. How should you be looking at it? Should you be concerned about the debt to GDP ratio or should you be thinking about what to do to recover? Okay, so yes, with the debt to GDP ratio, there are two ways to look at it. On the surface of it, it could look that we are quite high. But how high, like uh, the very first speaker, the former minister spoke about, it's more to do with where the money is going. Now, take the banking sector, for instance. The banking sector is one of the most uh, highly leveraged institutions mm -hmm. you can find globally because they usually use people's money to grow their wealth. But then, if you look particularly at that, banking can sometimes be one of the most lucrative areas that you find people getting into. That is on condition that the funds are being employed appropriately. So there are two things that we can do here. If you look at countries like Japan, who have almost more than 250% of their GDP, the question is, to what use are you putting the funds? And so those are issues we need to delve into. I think for Elliot, and then of course, clearly as we are speaking, over 90% of our revenue go into consumption and others. We are left with very little to grow. So, of course, we end up falling on debt. And, of course, this debt also begins to trigger more interest payments and other payments that are due. So it becomes a very vicious cycle unless we can find out which sectors will give us the best return. For which reason, when we do borrow, we're going to be channeling the money into these sectors. And they're going to yield more than it costs us to service those um, debt uh, obligations. Now, in doing that, therefore, then, we are going to actually benefit from the uh, implications of leverage. Because if I'm borrowing at a cheaper rate, and then I'm able to put that fund to use in a place that yields a much higher return, then, of course, the differential between my interest bill and then the returns from the funds that I'm putting to use becomes the catalyst for which I'm able to grow and then extricate myself out of the debt conundrum that we may find ourselves in. So on a more serious note, whether the debt is a lot more or is too much or is not, it's, it's for now, it's, it's more of we've got two ways, either to grow the economy, so find out what can we really do to expand the economy and grow such that we can service these 
and then we can start talking. So, but until what we have now, given the, should I say the infrastructure, we have the systems we are having, the research we have on the ground puts us around 50%. So if we are unable to do anything to change the structures on the ground, then obviously what we need to start looking at is how we're going to wean ourselves of debt. In fact, if you read other budgets from other countries, you try one I read sometime back for Finland, etc. They actually have a target of trying to go off debt. So in as much as we want to limit, sometimes when we read the budgets about the fact that, oh, we don't want to go beyond this point. But more importantly, can we look to either reducing or if we think that this is the only means of funding that we can get for now, then the question is, where do we channel these funds so that the returns out, outweigh the cost of what? Servicing those debts. And then, of course, the impact will be more positive for the economy. But, but it doesn't appear to me that you get a sense that we are investing in the right sectors, like you said, that will help us generate the income to, to even help service the debts and, 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 and leave some other for... Other, for, for other, you know, uh, uh, developmental jobs. Is that the impression I should be getting from you? In, in a sense, yes. I think sometimes the populists also don't help much. I think we sometimes make a lot of noise on a lot of other issues that genuinely, um, it, it can push anybody who is genuinely seeking political power to sometimes cue and then listen to those who make the loudest noise as opposed to doing what is right. And so um, I think one of the key things that I, we need to do strictly is to begin to look at research. Data is the, the, the new oil. Look at research and what does it tell us about where we should put the money? Because I think by not giving much attention to you know, research-based uh, policy decision-making and moves in terms of where we go as a nation, we are sometimes forced to move in the direction that the populace makes as much noise on. Whereas, in actual fact, in some cases, what will happen is that there are certain antecedents that once we are able to get those ones right, the things that the populace is asking for would automatically more like be uh, an outburst or byproducts of what we are doing right. Currently, I think the, 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 the chaos in the system can make it difficult for just about anyone struggling to find out how do you, you know, keep your... Uh, voters happy, but at the same time, you're growing. And I think that banter has become a case of, instead of the things complementing, they become substitutes. So we end up sometimes making the voters happy, and then we should change growth. Or we pursue growth, and then we make the voters unhappy, and then the voters out. So I think part of it also will come back to getting the populace quite well educated to know to, to know how to demand the right things, but not the nice things. So I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a delicate balance we need to find there. Very well. So I so want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Fiado, uh, for uh, uh, being with us this morning. We, we're just wrapping up. Uh, so Dr. Vera Oge Fiado is a senior lecturer at the Department of Finance University of Ghana. Um, I, I want to take your concluding remarks on this, uh, 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 Honorable uh, Rick <coughs> Hagan. Uh, a lot has been said. Uh, generally, you think that uh, the budget, like your colleagues have said, is hopeless. Uh, but we need to learn to see the silver lining. Uh, um, at least, so we, 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 we can make progress as a country. What should we be doing? What should be the next steps, you know, into full recovery? Uh, people have said we don't have to focus on debt. Let's focus on what we can do uh, to expand and to recover. When that is done, we can work our way back and, and see if we can deal with the debts. Uh, your concluding remarks, and that should capture, or should, should capture yeah. this, yes. Um, quickly, <clears throat> on something, uh, Solomon, I believe, Yes, so, so, Solomon, yes, said Solomon Eji. that I think uh, to refer to the government on the issue of uh, uh, whether um, the entrepreneurs or the youth will need some kind of a collateral mm -hmm. to borrow. What the government has said is that they are actually going to guarantee those loans. So you basically don't need to have any collateral or anything. But that is where the problem is. Mm. Because if you, if you are saying you are going to guarantee loans, then that becomes a contingent liability issue, mm -hmm. which obviously becomes a sovereign debt. And that is why you will either have to ask for more money or do something else. Otherwise, you have to tell us where that money is going to come from. Mm -hmm. On, uh, uh, um, generally, you will say that borrowing is not, is not a problem. Mm -hmm. As we have all said here, that if you are using that money 
to do things that will feed into your economy in terms of your GDP and create jobs for you, mm -hmm. then even debt itself that is, is not a problem in that sense. Because when you're doing this debt to GDP, your GDP is your denominator. Mm -hmm. So if you're able to expand your GDP, your debt itself will shrink will automatically shrink. without being in it. But the problem we have in Ghana is because of the structure of our debt and the structure of our economy. Mm -hmm. She did say about Japan having 250 um, in terms of the ratio, about the United States also over 100. But we are not Japan and we are not United States mm -hmm. because of the structure of our economy. If you look at our debt, this debt of 291 billion or 334, whichever way you look at it, about 49% <clears throat> of our debt mm -hmm. is basically external, 41%. Uh, uh, and about 49% of it is domestic. So when you look at it on the surface, you will say that, oh, we have most of our debt is domestic, so it's not a problem. Only 49% is outside, but that's a wrong way to look at it. Mm. Because foreign investors participate in our domestic debt. Okay. So basically what that means is that if those debts, whether they are treasury bills or one-year bond or whatever, these guys are participating in when those bonds are liquidated, they take their money out in dollars. So they mop your currency, that is your dollars in your system. And that creates an extremely great problem for you. Anytime, if you look at any time that a, a bond liquidate in terms of treasury or whatever, you see that the exchange rate goes up. Not only on your domestic side, but then that exchange rate will also affect your external debt itself. Mm. So your debt is going to continue to go up if government itself is a player in the market in terms of borrowing, then interest rate for entrepreneurs are never going to come down mm -hmm. because it's the government who goes and crowd the, 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 the yeah, entrepreneurs and then interest rate. So policies needs to be looked at very seriously. But, 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 but this government will argue that, for example, interest rates yeah. you know, have come down. The policy rate is around 13.5%. That has reduced the interest. That has caused a reduction in the interest rates uh, um, which hover around uh, 22, 23 but, but, but actually, percent from the nearly 30 percent that that he left. Yeah, exactly. Again, you realize that things are not enough. If you say this to an entrepreneur, that entrepreneur is still going to tell you that cost of you know capital is still very expensive, and w you don't stand a chance of competing with somebody else who's bringing capital from somewhere else to do business. So yes, interest rate has come down. But is it good enough? No. What else can be done? Government stop borrowing from your domestic market, thinking that once you are borrowing from home, it's better than borrowing from outside. Because there are foreign participants mm -hmm. in your market who are actually, you know, sucking the blood out of you, if I can put it that way. In the, on the issue of revenue, and then again, historically, mm -hmm. when you look at it, we have done all sorts of things. Brought in the tax base, as uh, my brother said, all these things, we've, we've had them for decades, but yet we are still not being able to realize, you know, the revenue. And as uh, my brother, um, what's his name? Yeah, uh, Iman, Imani. Imani, okay, Franklin. Franklin said, we've got to look at the whole model of taxation in this country again, because something is not working. And we cannot continue to expand tax base, digitization, and all these things that we are talking about if we're still not seeing the revenue. Because at the end of the day, if you are not able to re realize the revenue, these guys did not revise their, their, their end of year revenue. Yet, we have about 1% shortfall in the collection of taxes in the first six months of, of the year. So you ask yourself, what is going to change in the next six months? That makes this guy believe that they are going to be able to make the money. Mm -hmm. Even if you are relying on fossil fuel, that we are an oil you know, producing country, look at what is happening in the, in the world. The, oil, the fossil fuel is going to end up fading out, mm -hmm. and we are not making any provision. We are talking about electric cars and all these things. So even to become an oil-rich nation will in the future not help you. Mm -hmm. And we have to start thinking of shifting the economics to an area that will help us, you know. It's not just taking it fragmentally and saying that, oh, we have discovered that some professionals here are not paying taxes, so we are going for them. We have discovered that this is not here. We need a comprehensive review 
of the whole tax well. issue and make realistic target mm. because many a times look last last year the tax they will say COVID but 50 we realize about 50 50 something billion then the projection is 75 then you ask yourself how are you going to achieve that you know especially when you are coming out of pandemic so we don't also make realistic target mm -hmm. and therefore we underestimate even the deficit and that in the end creates problems for us we are going to overshoot our budget whether the finance minister comes to the house to ask for money or not a lot of ministries will overshoot their budget mm -hmm. a lot of spending is going to go on a lot of borrowing will go on on the new names butter trade like we did with the sino therefore don't add it to the death stock this does that in the long run they will all come to add up to the debt and the the, the strategy that this government is adopting of basically kicking the the can down the road of refinancing in the end is going to hurt, hurt us the refinancing obviously will give you the space mm -hmm. you know if you, give but you the space now to do yeah some your debt hasn't gone away mm -hmm. it's still going to be at the end of the day the generation that will come after you you can push all your debt now up until 2025 so that this government will have some room but whoever takes over we'll whether it's the ndc or the same government takes over is going to hurt them so we'll be kicking the, the can down the road until the debt snowballs to an Very extent well. where we'll be at a cliff and basically a small air will blow us and we'll go over the cliff. Thank you very much, uh, the Honorable Ricketts, uh, Kweku Hagan, MP for Cape Coast South and former Deputy Finance Minister and Regional Minister for the Central Region. We, 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 are, we've, we are wrapping up on this segment. Uh, Franklin, could you join us for the next segment? We'll refresh the panel and then we'll get back with the discussion on the Asin North uh, Parliamentary uh, uh, dispute, which was resolved this week in favor of uh, the petitioner, which in essence means that uh, James Jechi Kwesin uh, is no more a member of parliament after the election has been declared null and void because uh, the court said that he was not qualified at the time he filed his nomination. We'll deal with that uh, when we return from this break. My name is Salom Adonu, and you've been hearing Franklin Kujo, President of Imani Africa, uh, George Kweku Ricketts Hagan, MP for Cape Coast, Sub Dr. Vera Ogifiado, Senior Lecturer, Department of Finance, University of Ghana Business School, and Solomon uh, AJ, uh, Executive Director of Ghana Startup Network, and indeed uh, Frank M. Martin, Pebu, Private Legal Practitioner. We'll be back with a panel to deal with the legal matters. Don't go away. Yeah, welcome back to The Big Issue. We are live from our studios at number 11, Dr. Martin Lupin, Adabraka, and Accra. We are on TV, City TV, and on City 97.3 FM. Um, you can join the discussion uh, with your views on 0549-986-996. That's on WhatsApp, 0549-986-996, or 0550-5858-32. We just concluded a discussion on the media budget review and we have just refreshed the panel. And so we have, um, of course, Martin Pebu, private legal practitioner and director of the Human Rights and Governance Center. He'll still be here. Franklin Kujo, president of Imani, uh, will still be here. Um, Alex Ander Aban, honorable, is a private legal practitioner, member of the MPP and a former member of parliament. And Nick Bakpo Samwa Adu, private legal practitioner and a member of the NDC. So this week, um, one of the eight or so uh, disputes on the parliamentary elections that was resolved and it was resolved in favor of the petitioner the petitioner is uh, a mason and a citizen of ghana who took the matter to court challenging uh, the eligibility of the ndc candidate now mp who has been disqualified uh, james jetty Kwesin. and his point was that at the time he filed to be MP, he had allegiance to another country, which actually flew in the face of the constitution and other laws. The court found for him and declared that election 
as null and void, and um, so will subsequently mean that the electoral commissioner, the electoral commission, which was the second respondent in that petition, will have to organise a by-election for the re-election of a new MP for the people of Asin North. That is what we're about to discuss now. And so let me start with um, Nick Paco Samuel. It's been a while, Nick. Yes. Yes. So did this um, ruling or judgment of the court come to you um, as a surprise, both speaking as a legal practitioner and, 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 and as a, a leading member of the National well, Democratic I, Congress? I discussed this mainly as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And um, I... It's interesting. And the decision is interesting because it, it puts in context mm -hmm. a provision of the Constitution mm -hmm. which we have never interpreted before. Mm -hmm. You understand? Uh -huh. So you have had the Ezenato uh, case. case under 94-1, uh, mm -hmm. which dealt with the issue of being an eligible voter. Mm -hmm. Now, you've had 94-2, which is also one of the requirements that you must meet as, an as an eligibility criterion for being elected as a member of parliament, mm -hmm. or to hold the office of member of parliament. So this decision, literally, is the first time that we've had that particular provision being applied. Mm -hmm. I would restrict myself to the issue of whether the court had jurisdiction mm -hmm. to make the decision that it made, procedurally. Okay. I'm not going to go into the merits, because for me, if the court does not meet a jurisdictional requirement, then the matter doesn't start that, at all. that matter doesn't start at all, no matter how or what the merits of the it's a fundamental, issue. Issue, fundamental issue were. And so let's take the genesis from the Ezenato uh, uh, judgment, mm -hmm. which is actually the basis upon which the judge stood to give his understanding of 94 2 mm -hmm. as also meaning a particular that allegiance means that you if you hold a dual citizenship basically you you are you hold allegiance to another country, country. and that by virtue of that you must renounce mm -hmm. and renunciation in, in must also then mean that you must have evidence of the renunciation mm -hmm. what is the mode of uh, renunciation that will make you qualify as uh, uh, having no allegiance, allegiance to another country. country so you see critically if you look at there's an actual ruling it started off with an interpretation as to whether a person who is standing as a candidate for a party, because mm -hmm. this was a provision within the party constitution. So if you were a candidate standing for election as a member of parliament in a, 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 the party, and you were not yet a registered voter within an area, mm -hmm. will you qualify, okay, within the context of 94-1 mm -hmm. to... Uh, stand as member of parliament. Now, for purposes of education, our court structure and rules are clear. The interpretation or enforcement of the constitution is the exclusive jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. Mm. Courts, superior courts such as the High Court and the Court of Appeal, apply or interpret statutes, okay, or apply the constitution. However, where the matter borders on an interpretation of a particular provision, you must stay the action, if it is in the High Court, and refer the matter to the Supreme Court, either on the court's own volution mm. or upon an application by a party. Clearly, in my opinion, once, and most of the time, what are the indicators of whether there is a genuine case for interpretation? Mm -hmm. Number one, has the courts ever that is the Supreme Court, ever in respect of a constitutional provision, ever rendered an opinion on that particular provision. Mm -hmm. It's one of the key things. So if you look at the a plethora of cases where the courts, despite the merits or whatever the decision of the High Court has been, have cautioned, that the Supreme Court has cautioned the High Court, that when a matter comes up and it is the first time that an interpretation is going to be given to that particular provision, the best course of action is to, to refer, refer it. it to the Supreme Court. We have the Shrad case, which are done We have the Zanato case. The Zanato case, maybe the latest. Yes, in the latest. And other cases. So 
when you fall into the temptation of giving your meaning, you see, and at the heart of this particular case was what was the meaning of what? Allegiance. Mm -hmm. Once the court had to strenuously go around looking for a justification or a meaning to be given to the to the to the word allegiance clearly in my opinion there was the, an issue the of the court was limping the court was limping because the court could not cite one authority within the our jurisprudence as it is where the 94 2 had been interpreted i read the judgment through and through there was not a single authority the, what the court decided to rest itself on was 94 1 okay where the court in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court had said that for a person, that for, for, the, for the eligibility provisions to kick in, it kicks in at the time of filing for purposes of being a registered voter. But you see, we have a situation in our country where we have dual citizens, okay? And the process of renunciation of citizenship differs from country to country, mm -hmm. okay? So if you from the word go cannot categorically say that holding allegiance okay has been expressly provided for in the constitution to mean holding dual citizenship and therefore for purposes of satisfying the requirement of not uh, uh, holding allegiance to another country you necessarily have to have renounced and the process of renunciation is when you have the certificate of renunciation to prove in my honest and humble opinion I believe that you are going into the realm of interpretation so once it is a clear point of our law that you do not attempt even to go into the realm of what interpreting that provision i felt the safest course of action would have been for the court to stay the action and allow the supreme, supreme court, court to, make a, to make a determination of what it constitutes to one hold allegiance two when does that provision Kicking, would they rest back on their interpretation in the SNATO case to mean that for 94 1 and 94 2, both will be at the time of filing? Filing, if that is the position of the court, we are clear because you see, when you have a decision that still leaves doubt or that still leaves room for further argument, then I don't think you've helped. Has been conclusive, hasn't it's, been conclusive. The conclusion determined. is what we want. The decision is a first step, yes. It now gives people the opportunity to exercise various options. Mm. Appeal is one. Uh, I know there's the issue of the stay, mm -hmm. but I strongly believe that the, 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 the one of the fastest ways of getting resolution of this matter mm. is to have a sectoral application in the Supreme Court so that the Supreme Court will have an opportunity and we've seen the opportunity where the Supreme Court sits even in the vacation. This is a good opportunity where the, the judiciary has indicated that for electoral disputes, they want to resolve them quickly. Mm -hmm. Let's have the court be empaneled to give us clear direction as to what it means to be, uh, to, uh, to, to have allegiance, allegiance to another, another country. country. You understand? If the Supreme Court speaks and interprets all the various scenarios, I believe that it will either affirm the position as um, held by the court the court okay but even in there i'm sure they may go in the direction of still holding that decision down and they now taking the matter up themselves to give because that particular provision must be interpreted and so far as this is the first time that it has been well in this case you say he applied mm -hmm. an existing decision uh, well, as we call it, with Tatis Mutandis in respect of the 94 uh, one. Uh, 1, and it's now bringing it to the realm of 94 2. I think that there is a good ground for this decision to be uh, looked at again by the Supreme Court. I mm -hmm. think that the court ventured into an area of jurisdiction that it did not have. It and for have. me, for as long as there is a, there's, there's enough reason to believe that there was an attempt to interpret the Constitution. I think that this decision will not should not stand, mm. and I think that the the, the 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 MP affected clearly has very very good grounds to be able to challenge this particular decision. Very well. So, so the MP in question, uh, James Jachikwesin, he insists that he did no wrong, 
uh, in the filing of his nomination, that's part of the judgment of the court of uh, the Cape Coast High Court notifying his election. So, in a statement on the judgment, the first time he's uh, spoken on the matter, he assured his supporters of cling clinching to or holding on uh, to the seat. Let, let, let's see what he has to say. The Cape Coast High Court 3, presided over by Justice Kwesi Bwache, has ordered a fresh parliamentary election to be conducted in the Asin North constituency. The court has subsequently declared the election of the Asin North Member of Parliament, James Kwesi, as null and void. The ruling follows the dual citizenship case concerning the Asin North MP, which has been running for over six months now. Michael Ankumaninfa petitioned the court that the MP for Asin North, James Quasing, held both Ghanaian and Canadian citizenship at the time of his election and therefore must be restrained from performing the duties of a member of parliament. At the end of court sitting today, the judge, Justice Kwesi Bwachi, ruled in favor of the petitioner and awarded 30,000 cities in cost to be paid to Michael Ankumaninfa and 10,000 cities to the second respondent. The NDC, however, disagrees with the judgment. We've heard what the judge has had to say. And we, the lawyer in the case, uh, Justin Pagua, is actually at the moment obtaining a copy of the judgment, which we shall look at closely and make various decisions. We are not in the least perturbed. We know that that seat will remain an NDC seat, either through the courts or through an election. Whichever way it's looked at, we know that seat is going to remain an NDC seat. So we, have, we have no problem with that issue. Okay. So but it's important that the right things are done and the right processes and procedures yeah. are followed. Talent. So we shall study the judgment. Okay. Of importance is the fact that a lot has been made of the Zanetto case. Zanetto case dealt with Article 94.1. This case is under 94.2. The constitution itself deals with citizenship and allegiance as two separate things. If you look at the first part, it says you must be a citizen of Ghana. If you are not a citizen of Ghana, you cannot hold certain positions. You cannot hold this position, uh, president. You cannot be uh, a chief of defense staff, etc., etc. And then 94.2, it says you cannot be an MP if you do not, if you owe allegiance. There's a big difference between allegiance and citizenship, and sometimes they are mutually exclusive. Henry Nanabwachi spoke for the NPP on the ruling. This is a petition that was filed by our own friend Michael Ahunka Nimfa, Ankuma Nimfa. And today the court, after almost six months, has upheld our position and the petitioner's position for that matter. The court today has said that the election of Honorable Kuisin was in contravention of Article 94.2 of the Constitution and then also Section 92A of the Representation of People's Act, PNDC Law 284, and that the election of Honorable Kuisin is illegal, void, and of no effect. We have repeatedly said that Honorable Kwesin, at the time that he was filing his nomination to contest as an MP, was a Canadian and also a Ghanaian. All right, so you're welcome back uh, to the big issue. Uh, so that was just um, some uh, summary of what happened in, in, in the court earlier in the week. Um, Nick Pakpo Samoado is giving his view on the matter. He thinks that there was a jurisdictional issue and the court uh, should have just referred the matter of allegiance to the Supreme Court for 
an interpretation and in his view that would have uh, um, addressed the matter conclusively i mean lawyers have views that is his view let, let me let me test that view against uh, lawyer aban former minister and former former deputy minister and former mp he says that because of that issue about allegiance which the judge clearly struggled to to tackle you know by going into the zanetto case which clearly dealt with 94-1 and he importing that into 94 to i mean show that he was really struggling and because that hadn't happened before it was good grounds for him to have referred the matter to the supreme court for an interpretation of the word allegiance and how it should be applied in this matter i don't know what you think about that thank you very much uh, good morning to our viewers good morning to my friends here uh before going to uh, respond to what he said I just want to crave your indulgence to make some little correction. I have listened to a lot of discussions on this matter, and it appears we are using two words uh, wrongly. Some people are saying denounce your citizenship and all those kind of things. But the proper word is renounce. Renounce, yes. Renounce. yes. Oh, I mean, it's all over. Mm -hmm. People are using ah, denounce yeah. and all that. I don't know whether you have mm -hmm. observed that. <laughs> it's renunciation. It is renunciation. Mm -hmm. Renunciation. It is not uh, denunciation or something mm -hmm. like that. So those who are doing that, please, they, they should not give Ghana a bad name. I'm sure the uh, public has been educated. Thanks, yes. th thanks for your efforts. Uh -huh. <laughs> so having said that, uh, let me first concede that I have not read fully the judgment. Okay. Oh, okay. So I do not know the cases that the judge relied on. Mm -hmm. But I know that uh, from a number of cases from the Supreme Court itself, mm -hmm. it is not every word, every phrase, every sentence in the Constitution which must fall for interpretation. Otherwise, the Supreme Court itself will become inundated, we'll be inundated. with frivolous applications. Right? I do not know if uh, the judge made any reference to the Asari versus Attorney General case, which was reported in the 2012 One Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report at page 460. I didn't quite see Which that. One of the, uh, the, the, the one on citizenship, right? The one on citizenship. Yes. I, I didn't. No, I didn't quite see that. I didn't quite see that. That did not find space. Yeah. In, I, didn't see, I didn't see that in, 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 in the judgment. No. Probably, if the judge had been helped <laughs> with uh, that authority, the issue from my friend here about lack of jurisdiction may not have become an issue, <laughs> because in that case. Even though the Supreme Court did not directly say so mm. about owing allegiance, it clearly gave a direction that mm -hmm. owing allegiance to another country is almost, I mean, it's almost the same as being a dual citizen. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you read that judgment, you see. So I don't think that there must be first. Uh, interpretive issue which would call for a stay of the proceedings for that referral to be made to the Supreme Court to go and probably uh, 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 pronounce on the issue which had already been adumbrated before them and they had, gave, uh, they had, they had given a definitive uh, response to. But vulnerable, is it not a case that if a provision you know, is being applied and there is ambiguity or lack of clarity uh, in terms of its application, that is good grounds to refer the matter to the Supreme Court for interpretation. Of course. So but in this where, where case, we, 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 we are dealing with allegiance and, and others are mentioning citizenship and the mode of application issue. of that provision. Is that not, doesn't that uh, bring about a situation of, should I call it, lack of clarity I don't think that so. the Supreme Court should have dealt with? I don't think so. So in your view, it is clear. It is, it is very clear. It is very clear. You see, you must take time to read the full judgment in that Asari versus Attorney General case, mm. the one uh, which is reported in the Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report 2012 mm. at page 460. I took my time to read the opinion of Atiku mm -hmm. or acting CJRC was at that time, Dateba, mm -hmm. and then uh, Sofa Yakuf. The rest actually concurred in it. And they have dealt with this issue of owing allegiance. 
So you realize that even the Citizenship Act itself does not in any way mention being a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. Okay, they have given uh, certain, like, let me go to 16.2 of uh, the Citizenship Act, which states that without prejudice to Article 94.2 of the Constitution, no citizen of Ghana shall qualify to be appointed as a holder of any office specified in this section if he holds the citizenship of any other country in addition to his citizenship of Ghana. Then they give that is Chief Justice, Ambassador or High Commissioner, Secretary to Cabinet, Chief of Defence Staff or any Service Chief, IGP, Commissioner, Custom, Excise and Preventive Service, Director of Immigration, all that. But you don't see member, member of, of parliament, parliament. Mm -hmm. right? Why so, in your view? For me, I think that because Article 94 2 itself, uh, Article 94 2 itself has given qualifications mm. and has used the word owing allegiance to another country. country. Okay? Already. It's been dealt with. It's been dealt with. For me, it has been dealt with. In any case, they always talk about a voluntary act mm. of going to take that allegiance. In fact, in the opinion of uh, Justice Atuguba, he even went as far as using biblical uh, 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 provisions to explain the matter, where Jesus said that, oh, you cannot, be, you cannot serve two masters, two masters. and you cannot uh, be a servant of money and also God, Mama, God all Mama, that, yeah. right? And said, these are very, very high officers which requires unalloyed allegiance to the state. And that is why when you have dual citizenship, obviously once you have dual citizenship, you swear allegiance to that other state. As MP, before you go ahead to take your seat. The only thing you can do before being sworn in is when you take part in the nomination or the election of the speaker. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you would have to be sworn in before you can be part of the parliamentary business. Okay. And what you do, you swear the oath of allegiance. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, when you are a citizen by birth and you have not aspired to any of these positions, you are a citizen with all the full rights, but you don't swear the oath, the oath of, allegiance. of allegiance. So put all these things together. I think that this must not be an issue for interpretation, which would require a stay of the proceedings and a referral of that uh, supposed interpretive matter mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court for determination. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, can, I, can, I, can I just see no, let, 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 let Martin come in. I'll, I'll come back to you. Martin, I mean, he started off, he started mm -hmm. us off on, on, on the fundamental issue of jurisdiction. I don't know what your own thoughts are in respect of that. You think that the matter should have been referred to the Supreme Court for our interpretation before the judge will come back and apply what the Supreme Court said or the way it was dealt with was, was, was proper and, and it was fair? Uh, because of subsequent events, or let me say, because of... Uh, Events just prior to the here uh, the delivery of the, uh, the judgment, mm -hmm. uh, I'm no, I, I don't subscribe to the argument that the court lacked jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. The event I'm referring to, me maybe I don't know if it escaped you. Mm -hmm. The uh, this is, what do you call it? Judge Kwesin was in the Supreme Court oh, on the 20. Uh, I was in court on that okay. day. I think on Wednesday. Yeah, he attempted. But the court threw him out. out. Actually, uh, the, the, the application couldn't f f fly, so he had to withdraw. And he was slapped the, with 5,000 The application was in respect of interpretation of the word allegiance. Ye yes, that's what he wanted. So mm. this is what he did. He applied to the Supreme Court that, okay, this trial judge has failed to refer the matter to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court itself should look at the case and take it and okay. do it. And that's not the first time. Mm -hmm. it, it's happened before in the Zaneto case. Mm -hmm. And also there's Metul Nunu. But the Zaneto Metul... case, the ruling had come. Like what? Huh? The ruling, the Zaneto case, the ruling, the substantive ruling had been made. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, but when they went for supervisory jurisdiction, they yes. said the court should take it and then go into it. The court did. Mm -hmm. But you see, in, in the Wednesday thing that you referred mm -hmm. to, just mm -hmm. reply, in the yeah. Wednesday thing that you referred to, I wasn't in court, but yeah. the report I had mm -hmm. was the effect that the court was the opinion that it was premature mm -hmm. and that the mode of seeking to invoke the court's jurisdiction had not arisen because they should go back to the high court mm -hmm. and actually move a motion or whichever mm -hmm. word that you use to, mm -hmm. to seek to say that the court did not have jurisdiction mm -hmm. in, determining. In, in determining the issue or that a, an issue of interpretation had arisen. arisen. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the uh, reply mm -hmm. or response of, to the petition mm -hmm. that they, 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 they filed, mm -hmm. none of the processes that had been before the court, including the issues for determination, had raised the issue of an interpretation of no, no, allegiance. It, it, it was no, it's there. You it's look, in the amended answer. It, if you look, read the judgment, look at the judgment. Look, let's go I, look, yes, yes, an amended answer. I know. Answer. Look, 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 at, look, at the, look at the four, issues that five, were judged. I'll, uh, I'll get to that page. It's expressed in the judgment. Okay, the you judgment go ahead with your submission. I'll get you that page. Yeah, in the amended uh, answer, the petitioner raised this issue of jurisdiction and said that there will be a preliminary legal objection. The, the jurisdiction he yeah. raised was in, in respect of another thing. He said the court did not have jurisdiction to question the EC's administrative work. That is what he said. He did not raise the issue of the jurisdiction in respect of the interpretation of the issue of uh, Article 94.2. So it, when you sought to invoke the court's jurisdiction on Wednesday, the court said you had not come, nothing had happened before the high court. That raises the issue of interpretation of 94.2. Go back to the court. Raise the issue of interpretation. If the court refuses you, come back to us. So mm -hmm. when, and on Wednesday morning, mm -hmm. they attempted to file mm -hmm. the processes. Mm -hmm. And then there was the claim that the mm -hmm. court registrar had blocked the mm -hmm. court. Mm -hmm. And because... so. The court in the judgment actually dealt with the issue of jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. It said that it had jurisdiction to deal with electoral matters pertaining to the mm -hmm. qualification to be member of parliament. Mm -hmm. The issue of interpretation of okay, Article 94, allegiance, allegiance it, it had arise. not yeah, been, it, it been raised. Arise, yeah. So the mm -hmm. combined issues that the, the, the parties filed mm -hmm. were, were to do with eligibility and what constituted... Uh, whether you had filed, when was the operative uh, 94 to when did it start? Did it start at the time of filing mm -hmm. or it started at the time of being sworn in as MP? Or everyone at that stage did not raise the issue of uh, allegiance because the court actually spent about two, three, four, five pages to deal with its jurisdiction mm -hmm. to hear the matter pursuant to uh, the election, public elections uh, uh, act. So Clearly, at the time that they realized or were instructed by the court to go to the high court and raise the motion, when they attempted to file, unfortunately, it was too late. Because if they had raised the issue as a part of the memorandum of issues, clearly they would have had a basis to go to the, the, Supreme, court. To the Supreme Court. That's why I'm really fortified by my point that, look, the issue of uh, uh, interpretation of allegiance, especially when in the 94 one, it actually had to do with the interpretation of a party constitutional provision. It didn't have to do even with the interpretation of uh, uh, the, the electoral public elections uh, uh, act, which was what in this case it was. In, in the Ezenato case, the court even though complained that we have, the court was being forced to interpret a, 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 part, a political party's constitution, that even the political party should avoid wholesale putting the provisions of the constitution into their party constitution to cause confusion. It still went ahead and dealt with 94. So that's why I thought that if yes. for a party provision, the court itself had had to determine a party provision, how much more a constitutional provision dealing with a public election that had happened? Definitely, there should be the need of it. Let me tell you, in this court, uh, when you work in courts for, I mean, what we call practice, you mm. go to court you, every day, you see how they practice it. Trust me, look, if that point was really, really that strong, the Supreme Court would not have spared any effort. They would have gone straight. They would have taken the matter and gone in. You see, because... So, so, so your, your view is that the, the point on the allegiance was not imprecise. It was clear and it did not... A matter of interpretation did not arise. Not that, uh, 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 yes, I, put, I think putting this, uh, this in simply, because viewers must understand. In Lanty. simple terms, yes. In simple terms, yes, it did not. Because if the court had seen clear injustice, especially mm. as 
the matter had been adjourned for judgment. Judgment was going to be the next day. The next day. If the Supreme Court, because there are other cases where if the Supreme Court sees such an injustice, they will take it and go mm. in. But the fact that when they went in there, their application couldn't fly, that in itself is an indication that mm, this matter of the allegiance may not be that strong, trust mm. me. Because the other cases, you know the case of uh, British Airways versus Attorney General. Yeah. Mm. Somebody even filed, eh? he went and did he was invoking the uh, original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the British Airways, eh? but it turned out that they were wrong. The Supreme Court took it and used it as supervisory jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. You see, so you come to court this way, you are totally out of court, meaning that if they don't do justice, they will just throw you out simplicity and go away. But the court saw that, no, there is there a patent injustice. So no, they, they had come to court on an original jurisdiction. You've been there. Okay, so to make it easier for lawyers, <laughs> uh, I mean, non-lawyers, <laughs> yes. you have to be careful. So what, what is happening is that the British Airways went to court, okay, on a matter thinking that it's A, it turned out that when they got to court, the Supreme Court said, no, 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 the matter is not A, it's rather B. And so the Supreme Court didn't say, oh, because you've come to court saying this matter is A, we just dismiss it and go away. The Supreme Court saw where the answer was and thought that, no, this criminal prosecution that is taking place in the circuit court is an illegality. Mm -hmm. So we would not say go and come back another time. So they turned it into one for supervisory jurisdiction and did justice to their matter. There are several other cases you see that, look, the, the court, the same Supreme Court, you come for A, then they see that, oh, no, no, that's not where the matter lies. It lies somewhere. And they are made to do justice. They will attend to it. Uh, for lawyers, you know the case of NIC versus Gihog. There are so many other cases. The, the, and even the judge here, uh, Justice Kwesi Boach, even referred to some of those cases where the Supreme Court look at the evidence before it. This evidence you've brought, what does it entitle you to? So, because the court does what we call substantive justice, justice, not technical justice. So they look at what you've placed before it. So the point I'm making is that when uh, this uh, Mr. Quaison presented a case to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, having seen everything they brought in their affidavit, if they could see a clear constitutional injustice, the Supreme Court would have risen to the occasion. But, see, but because it wasn't apparent, it was like, okay, you go back, raise it, and then see, we'll see. We'll take cues yes. from the bench as well. Uh, if, if yes. you, you, as much as mm -hmm. you... You see, because, and I, I, I can understand if the court, for example, refrained from getting in there because if you look at the issues that had been set down mm. by the court, mm. the court did not see any issue of interpretation. Mm. If you look at the issues, you mm. had agreed to the issues. Mm. In fact, the court, the judge says, mm. both lawyers were added them yes, in respect of the facts and in respect of the issues. Mm -hmm. The issue before the court for mm -hmm. jurisdiction was about mm -hmm. whether or not the court had jurisdiction to apply mm -hmm. the public elections uh, provisions in respect of uh, the qualification of, uh, of a person. Remember and they need to set aside the, 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 the issues issue, determination of the matter. And, and there were two uh, issues, in res uh, two laws being applied. 94-2 and the, the, the statute. Of you the, understand? Uh, so yes, so if yes, you had not raised the issue, that issue in my humble opinion was raised belatedly mm -hmm. you understand so once you had raised it and the court directed you to go back to the court by and raise the issue of 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 jurisdiction perhaps on the tuesday night you could you should you, you could have put your things in order because clearly when you left the court around 12 to the next morning whatever you had to do and he's a practitioner a practitioner mm. all of us are practitioners mm. because if you are unable to arrest the mm. decision mm. and the decision goes mm. then you can cry over us you mm. now have to move mm. forward because mm. you had gone to the court the court had given you mm. an indication you understand it is you it's, we go to court and take cues from the bench they may they may sympathize with what you are saying and may tell you that you may have a case but at the stage where you had brought the matter you may not have properly invoked our jurisdiction and jurisdiction is important mm. because if you come by way of the supervisory jurisdiction mm. and you are not coming by way of the original jurisdiction mm. okay there must be standards that you must meet oh, but when the they court, see injustice they no, step no, the, the, the when the court sees injustice I just remember Metulunu but, but, look, but look, when it comes to the issue of supervisory jurisdiction you and I know they are more strict with the issue of supervisory jurisdiction than they are with its original jurisdiction. If you, for example, title your writ wrongly in respect of an original invocation of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction, and they think that maybe you should have come by enforcement and you came by interpretation, they may look
look at it differently. But when you invoke the court's supervisory jurisdiction, they are strict because your grounds for invoking the court's supervisory jurisdiction are, are very clear cut. Lack of of jurisdiction. So your first question to me was that do I subscribe to the issue of the jurisdiction? And yes, yes, based on because the court was seized with the material if read and at their level at the Supreme Court when they see injustice, they are no longer bound by the strict procedural rules. When they see clear injustice, and I've already cited you the several cases, okay, there are so many and even the judge himself uh, cited some because what the court looks at at the end of the day is that what evidence have you brought to us? When they read that evidence and they say mm, there's something wrong, then they will slow down on the technicalities. Mm. They will slow down, and as I've said, the cases are bound. So, to the extent that the Supreme Court saw the materials before the judgment and didn't go into the matter, well. Uh, I really don't subscribe to the uh, but, 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 but point I mean, that even, there even was no looking at it on the surface of it, you know. So I'm, I'm coming to uh, Lawyer on, on the surface of it, at the time nomination is open for filing to be done, the, the general view is that the issue about your qualification becomes a, becomes a matter to be dealt with. If at the time you were filing, you, you had not renounced your your, your citizenship or, or allegiance to another country, it, it clearly takes you out of it. So you are not qualified. I think that, that was on the basis, that was the basis upon which the court made that determination. So th this whole issue about jurisdiction and things that Nipaku Ado is raising, you know, it's kind of obfuscating the matters a bit. I don't, I don't really know what to think. Yeah, you see, um, issue of citizenship is very, very critical because it comes with it a bundle of rights, of course, with attendant responsibilities as a citizen of a country. And the world over, nobody wants to, or no country would want that in their dealings with an individual, that person becomes stateless. So each person will have to have all some allegiance to a state. Exactly. Good. Now, the process of renunciation will have to end, it will have to crystallize with the issuance of the certificate, then you will say that, yes, I have renounced. Because the question is, if you put in an application that I'm a Ghanaian citizen by and birth, I want to be citizen of another country. By a voluntary act, I'm now a citizen of Canada. For purposes of going to contest the election in my country, I want to renounce my citizenship, my Canadian citizenship. They will first have to be sure that indeed, when that exercise is done, you will still be a citizen, you will still of, a be a citizen of, a, of one country. That will be the first thing they will do. Mm. Having done that, that whole thing is a process. When you start, it is not a point of no return. It, it, may, it may not succeed. Yes, you could even go back. To say that, yes, I said I was going to contest, and that's why I put in the application. But upon second thought, I won't. So I'm withdrawing. Mm. That's also possible. And so, this is not a matter that we as lawyers can say that, oh, uh, we can use equitable rules to deal with it. Oh, once you have started, equity must see it as something that which would be done anyway. Ought to, so, see as, as that done, ought that would be done. Uh, no. This one is a matter of strict law. You must go through the whole process. It crystallizes and has effect only when the process is ended. It's concluded. If the process is not concluded, and then you go and file your nomination, when it is not concluded, you would commit perjury because in filing your nomination, one of the questions that you will be asked to answer is do you owe allegiance to any other country it's on the easy form mm -hmm. right there and at the time you knew that you had not concluded that process and if you have not concluded that, that that process in going to say that you don't you don't owe allegiance to any other country that's is false false and that's perjury mm. and so he had started the process thankfully the certificate is all over on social media and the date is on it and the date is clearly on it and they stated that 
as of that particular date, you cease to be a Canadian citizen. So even the day before, suppose there was some upheaval in Ghana and Canadians were being evacuated, he would have qualified to be evacuated as a Canadian. Mm. So I don't think uh, we should play any ostrich about this and do some semantic games. This is a process that ends with the issuance of the certificate. Mm. And to my mind, so long as he had not completed that process, he was a Canadian citizen at the time that he filed. Yes, he, he, the, the judge in the, in the, in the judgment made, made, made quite a practical point. And he said that you could not say that you were a citizen of a country, for example, on the day you put in your application. See, the process had to conclude. So I, I am not going to go. See, the, for me, the issue is simple. Mm. And I disagree with my learned friend, Marty, when he talks about injustice. Mm. Let's, be, let's be practical. When you go to the court, especially the Supreme Court, the first and fundamental issue is about whether you have invoked the court's jurisdiction properly or not. Mm. If you came to the Supreme Court on a supervisory jurisdiction, you must have a decision that you are it com coming to, to set, set aside. aside. One of the things the court raised was that, where is the decision that you are coming to seek to set aside? So your view is that they did not go to the Supreme Court they properly? They didn't go to the Supreme Court properly. At the time that he went to the... He had the benefit of sitting in the court. So I was looking for some first-hand narrative no, in I terms of... Aha! Uh -huh. So that's why. Because the report I read, okay, was in respect of, one, whether there was a decision that they were seeking to set aside by way of Seturari. You can and come to the court. No there was no decision. They had gone to the court. You, if you were coming for a constitutional interpretation... And you are invoking the the, the you, provision. You oh, let's be let's for listeners. You no, 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 please. Let's let's no, no, no. It has it has nothing to do with the calendar. It has it has it has nothing to do with the calendar. No, no, no. I've already told you that there are a number of decisions that also show you can go for certiorari if they see that what you are saying is wrong. But what is the basis of going for certiorari? You are going for certiorari. I'm coming. You are going to. Let me just try. Are you saying that you can just go to the court and file a certiorari? The the jurisdiction of the court. The Supreme Court said. It's a certain way. And, yes. and expect the court and to do justice. How? Turn it around. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. so what is the decision? No, 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 no,
what can be better than allowing them to be part of, the, of our body politic and, and, and then try to contribute to nation building? If I use the word backward, because I think that provision is up for amendment, and I commend Honorable Kennedy Osei Nyaku, who happens to be the MP for Akim Suedru, who I think on July to, June 29th had uh, managed to put together, an, uh, well, it's an amendment bill, really, to amend Articles 8 and 94. But those articles are truly backward in, in current times. So um, all I've got to say is that let's look forward uh, let's 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 support the likes of Kennedy and Nyaku to get this amendment bill through, so that uh, we we. I mean, I feel I feel very very let down that in this day and age you still have this uh, on our statutes really. Um, as I said, we have been part of this conversation for Sasari. I recall I've just forgotten the year, but I think four five years ago, we did a big program with him at the. Um, the British Council, where we brought together people who are deemed to be dual citizens and what have you. And it was a lightning conversation. I was fairly well educated, really. But at the end of the day, I asked myself, to what end? What end? I mean, why should people who are contributing to this economy, one way or the other, be barred from uh, taking up the mantle of leadership. It's not as if <laughs> those occupying current positions are doing anything significantly better anyway. So what shows that once we give opportunity to those who are significantly adding to the value of this economy, uh, then all of a sudden hell will break loose. What is mm. there to steal? What is there to take away? What is there to benefit, <laughs> really, when these persons are already supporting the economy? I think we should open it up and allow um, uh, Ghanaians who have uh, endeared themselves in other uh, in other parts of the world to be part and parcel of this uh, country's organisation. I don't understand how we could, and I understand that in some political parties, you can't even be a dog catcher if you owe some sort of allegiance or nationality to some other country. How so, really? Hmm. I mean, that's all I've got to say. We need to change this, and I'm happy that. Honorable Kennedy uh, Osei has um, managed to put this amendment bill together, and uh, we should all support him. Very well. So, so let, let's do some practical matters now. What, what, what happens next? Is it that once the court is made the declaration or the determination that that election was null and void, he automatically loses his seat, or the speaker? must declare that seat vacant. How does it work? You have been in Parliament, lawyer man. I don't think it's the Speaker who uh, declares. Uh, 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 because it is the Electoral Commission who goes to tell uh, the people of Ghana that these are the people who have been duly elected. Mm -hmm. Now, when the court has made a declaration, the uh, Electoral Commissioner is only to inform the speaker. The speaker. Yes. It is not the speaker who will declare that seat vacant. Mm. He is only to inform the speaker of things that have happened, for which reason it has led to that vacancy being created. Mm. Yes. So, so the, of course, in, the, in this case, the Electoral Commission itself was a respondent. Yes. In cases where the Electoral Commission, for example, is not a respondent, how does the Electoral Commission get to know? Somebody must serve the judgment on the EC to enable the EC take the necessary steps? That's always what, what is done. Even when the EC is in uh, the courtroom, we usually have to serve the entry of judgment mm -hmm. on them. But in this case, because they are responded, they don't have to serve them because they were party to the... To, to because the And the others were yes. directly And the others were exactly. directly at them. So, so, so what, what then happens? Yeah. Can he, now that he's, he's, he's renounced, if the parties open nominations again, can he reapply and contest the election again? I, 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 I think that... Uh, in situations like this, it would be a slap in the face of the law itself mm. for him to be allowed to uh, contest. But but nothing nothing he's stops him. Is he disqualified? Because now he's yes. Ghanaian fully, yes. and 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 if the party will elect him or will choose mm. to elect him, why not? Let's see how it plays. No, I remember mm. he's also in court, so let's see how the court actions also play out. Okay, so th th there's another led to this. The the criminal side, indeed, a gentleman in the central region has petitioned the CID 
to investigate this. I mean, coming on the leg of perjury, that he. So I'm coming to you, Martin. He, mm -hmm. he, he, he falsely made declarations, mm -hmm. you know, on the nomination forms in respect yeah. of his citizenship or allegiance. Mm -hmm. You know, how will this travel? How are we to expect that this will, will travel? Well, I, I see people drawing. So first answer is that. Uh, it's not easy to answer based upon the uh, cases that have gone to court so far. Mm. The easiest that people are drawing an analogy to is the Adamu Sakali. But this one is different, far different. Because this one, let's not forget that he sent in the renunciation 19 December 2019. 19. Okay? And then they said, it takes about six to nine months. But COVID came, he says. Yes. So you can see that there's good faith. Look, let, to be very clear, this is not a case that I think that we should waste time on thinking of a criminal mm. prosecution. No, mm -hmm. no, no. You see, we don't have enough resources. <laughs> so there are better cases that you see a good case, you pursue. <laughs> this one is not a good case to pursue for criminal prosecution. There's good faith evidence, 19 December 2019. And I think it's supposed to take six to nine months. COVID is delayed. It. And most especially, the point is that, and you know his point, so when it comes to the substance of it, in terms of I'm putting on a, lay, a layman's cap now, I'm not uh, a citizenship lawyer, okay? So, but the layman argument, it makes a lot of sense. He has sent the letter, please, I don't intend to be a citizen of Canada anymore. 19 December 2019, not even 2020, not in the year 20, 2019. So there's somebody who has done that. And he expects that it's just a mere formality that it will be granted. And then let's come to this, Salom. And this is the biggest point of it. The reason why I don't think a criminal prosecution is necessary. Otherwise, EC should also be prosecuted. When you put in the nomination, you see the youth of the area sent in a petition to the EC that we think this man is not qualified because of these facts, the Canadian citizenship. EC looked at it and okayed it. Mm. Salom, the EC looked at it and okayed it. Especially so, when his response to the EC came with the renunciation certificate. Excellent. With the date of 26th November. Excellent. So as for the criminal prosecution, please, look, look when you are using uh, power, sometimes you can say, oh, let the judge decide. No, but there are some cases that we shouldn't spend resources on. There are more cases, you will tell you, lawyers are here, they'll <laughs> tell you when we go. Eh? Sometimes you can have a criminal prosecution one year on, one and a half years on, mm. they are not even jurors to sit on the mm. case because we don't have enough resources to motivate ju the, the, the jurors mm. to get more people and all that. So there's a question of resources. So on the facts of such a case, where even the constitutionally mandated body came in, was told about this, they wrote to him, please respond. He responded and showed the certificate. Then the EC gave him the all clear. You can't turn around and prosecute such a person. It would be a waste of our resources, please. Mm. Less better. It's different from Sakande, so where he was hiding it and deceiving uh, this and the EC. Do you, do you get it? Yeah, so let's better spend our resources on other uh, serious criminal cases, not this one. All right. that, and that's how come I find it curious that the judge went ahead and uh, awarded costs against him in favor of EC. EC. The very institution that looked at his renunciation papers and said, oh, yes, you are good to go. Uh, that, that one, I hope that on appeal mm -hmm. it will be looked at. Because the EC that led him into all of this. <laughs> if the EC <laughs> wasn't <laughs> clear... The EC shouldn't get a penny. Uh, yeah. EC, because that's very incongruous. You constitutionally mand mandated body, you are, if you are not sure, go to court. Go to court. Or ask. investigate. Do, do yes. something. Yes, but you sit down and allow him to go, and then you go into court, and then you are giving... Said they allowed, I think, I think the, the EC said they allowed him on the basis of his statutory declaration also. I think I, I saw oh, something that, That's like that. an afterthought. Look, <laughs> he's brought the, the, the renunciation certificate and showed them. There was a petition, and let's not take this for granted, a petition by the youth. youth. You receive a petition, you ask for his response, he shows you a renunciation. Statutory, statutory declaration. He shows you the renunciation certificate. Mm -hmm. You look at it and you are happy with it. And you say, yes, carry on, uh, Mr. Quisin. He carries on and then today in court, you, you are receiving 10,000. EC shouldn't receive that money. All right, let, let's look at the politics of it. So we heard the minority speak in parliament. How did you say corporation will suffer? And, and he actually sought to say that the government of the day or the executive was surreptitiously using the judiciary to tilt the balance of power. 137, 137. Now, 
137, 136, and one somewhere in the middle. Uh, did you think that he should have gone, or the politicians should have gone that far, given that the judiciary is a different arm on its own, and considered all the things and, and, and you see, the, that's the come background, to that The background to that is to do with the, what I'll call the shenanigans that went on that morning mm. in respect of the attempt to file processes at the court. I think it was despicable, if it's true, that the registry of the court at 8 o'clock up to 9 o'clock was empty. <laughs> Cash point empty, registrar absent, deputy registrar absent. I think if it is true, that conduct must be reported to the judicial council and action taken mm. because it doesn't bode well. You see, the judicial, the, the, the judicial uh, service must at all times be seen, not only that it is, but must be seen to be a neutral arbiter in all matters. Mm. Not the judge. I'm talking about even the members of staff of the judicial service. So if it is true, the complaints that, and I have very little reason to doubt lawyers who were there at 8 o'clock, mm. you understand, vehemently protesting the fact that they were there as early as 8 to file processes in respect of a motion to bring to the courts at the, pardon? No, whatever it was, if at 8 o'clock, when we all know that the court registry is open at 8, mm. the court sits at 9. You understand? So if I have a process to file and the teller is not there, the registrar is not there, the deputy registrar is not there, and they only come in after the judgment is read, that is wrong. You see, when you do these things, then obviously you also open up for the, the, the politician to then begin to say that, look, why would you prevent me? Because even if it was a last ditch attempt to do what I want to do, allow me to file. If the court decides to disregard the, 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 the filing, that is the court's decision. But why would it be? And this is not the first time that the, the, the registry of that court were having clashes with the lawyers of the MP. MP. You understand? So this is a repeat complaint. And it is not good enough. There were issues with respect to how the process was served on the uh, parliament as at the 7th of... Uh, yeah, and it's all shenanigans to do with it. I think that the judicial secretary must look at the conduct of her officers at the Cape Coast, Coast Registry. Coast. Because if you do that, then the minority leader, on the back of that, may have a point when he makes the allegation that, look, if I am not seen to be getting access, you no, know, justice is not only about what is done in the court, but the access to the it court. as well. The MP, as a party to the suit, must be given every opportunity to defend himself. It's a constitutional right. And so if there is any machination by a member of the judicial service, and if it is indeed true that, and I'm hoping that they recorded those things, the fact that the place was empty as at the time, because we now have smart cameras where you can actually use time and everything, those persons must be queried. Because if it's a second or third time that this thing has happened, then the man's rights were actually violated. And that is not good enough. Mm. So I'm praying and hoping that that issue will be picked up and that a formal complaint will be lodged by the party affected so that we can have a clear, you know, uh, 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 and, uh, and a better standard when it comes to our access to, to justice. Mm. If those things are not present, then you have little room. So because you must not even give somebody the opportunity to complain that he went to court and didn't get or was denied certain rights that would affect his outcome. These are things that affect the, the, the perception yeah, about uh, justice. Uh, Find out on this, and I'll come to you, Laban. If, if you look at the judgment, the judge sought to make some suggestions about speedy trial, so as we, we saw in the, in the presidential election petition. And his view was that we should amend the rules in a manner that will uh, circumscribe or in a manner that to make the time for hearing of parliamentary election petitions definite so that we don't uh, keep going till whenever, maybe two months, three months, or even six months, and we know that it will be determined within this period. As we speak, we, are, we have a number of such or similar cases still in the courts. It's, it's, it's eight months or so into 
the new administration and, and people don't even know where they stand in respect of their cases in court. What do you think about that generally? You think we should give them a definite time or we should just allow the system to flow? Uh, uh, coming on the background that in the election petition proper, the presidential one, one of the, 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 the grievances of the, the petitioners was that the matter was being rushed and, and, and justice was being sacrificed for speedy trial. I cannot agree with uh, the judge more. Mm. You see, we have history to guide us. We have the yeah. Isaac Amu versus Adachi. Mm -hmm. That case went through slowly in the courts for four years. <laughs> and by the time that the, the case was ended. decided, yeah, the, term. the term had been served mm. by the other party. Yes. And if we can do that with the presidential one, of course, the circumstances of or the, the, the peculiarities of the case may give room for some kind of allowances to be made. But at least they should be subscribed within some time. I believe that in the presidential one, which says that 42 days, obviously we went beyond that. Mm -hmm. But guided by that, there was some kind of expedition in making sure that things were done as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Same has been done for the uh, petitions in the parliamentary elections too. Because as at now, the person is supposed to come and serve for four years, mm -hmm. starting 7th of January. Now, we are in August. Mm -hmm. I mean, tomorrow we are in August. August. In August. And I don't think that we are going to see finality in these cases. Mm -hmm. And if they want to use the judicial process, to, uh, if I say, waste the time. Uh, you would see the juju and tricks of lawyers at play. Mm. Right? No you know it. There's no, no, there's no juju in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, spiritism <laughs> and all this. People already things. have their own perceptions about but, us. Yeah, so don't, don't even no, confirm oh, it. Exactly. So, but, but the point is that... They say the point is that, out their face down, you know. <laughs> but the point is that, you know... The as chicanery I do, of lawyers. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. the chicanery <laughs> of <laughs> lawyers. Good. <laughs> so maybe the chicanery of lawyers, mm -hmm. where you know that the application you are going to file in the court stands no chance of succeeding. Mm. But at least you put it in to create uh, time, or right. to, to, buy time. to buy time. <laughs> right? We do that. <laughs> Lawyers do that. Especially in the case where your client uh, owes money. money and he is struggling to, to raise money, uh, somewhere, raise money to somewhere. If you don't do that quickly... You file unnecessary <laughs> counterclaims. His, 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 property, <laughs> his property is going to be seized in a deficient you try, I mean, this is... That it, confession it is, is misconduct. <laughs> but, it happens. So, but, but let us go to the politics of it. Mm. You see, when we play our politics in Parliament because of its composition, and of course collaterally with the executive, we should be very, very careful not to draw the judiciary into it. Mm. This one, it goes for both NDC and MPP. We should not bring the judiciary into it. Because as soon as the judiciary, which to me is the bastion of our democracy, crumbles or is seen to be overly partisan and people lose confidence in it, our democracy is doomed. So if the minority but you see, that, that, that's a good point you made. But that also goes for the judiciary. So the, 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 the situation uh, Ni is painting, for example. I'm going there. Okay. And that's why I would agree with him mm -hmm. that if indeed it was, con it was contrived, mm -hmm. that whole description so that we are given. Between eight and nine, when the, gentleman, when the people wanted to file you know, a process, there was nobody there, then that surely should be wrong. Yes. Then those rules should be dealt with on that personal level. Mm -hmm. What happened? If investigation shows that indeed there was some uh, puppet master who, <laughs> who did that, well and good, then you deal with that very well. on its own merit. Very well. I beg you, it's very important. Very well. This is still a big issue coming to you live from our studios at number 11, Dr. Martin Lupin Adabraka.
in Accra. Uh, we've been discussing the matter of the Asin North uh, uh, parliamentary seat that has been uh, election that has been declared null and void. And we want to take a quick break. We'll come back and then conclude for today's discussion. Don't go away. All right, you're welcome back. We are, we, are concluding, uh, we are concluding the program and we are taking concluding remarks on the matter of the Asin North uh, uh, election and, and, and all of that. Indeed, Professor Azai and Co., who have been proponents of, uh, uh, you know, uh, scrapping this whole dual citizenship, uh, 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 should I say, constriction of rights in things they can do in Ghana, think that that part of the law should be repealed. It's been something he's been fighting all along the Supreme Court, the 2012 judgment that Laban talked about, etc. I'm just going around the table to pick the views of my, my panelists on this, whether it's time we, we, we scrap that part of the law so that no matter what your status is, as a dual citizen or, or full citizen, you can aspire to any office of the land. Uh, 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 oh, I think that, you see, the dual citizens will fight for some additional rights mm. that go with being a dual citizen. Those who would hold one nationality, you know, as just citizens of Ghana, probably will also want to, for security reasons, you understand, primarily as well, as other reasons, want to also say that, look, there must be some privileges that go with being only a Ghanaian. And there are some privileges that go with being a dual citizen. If you choose, you must go with what it is that go with being just a citizen of Ghana and also being a dual citizen. There must be, and you see, and one of the examples that uh, uh, lawyer Aban gave was in respect of when there's a security outbreak, for example. And you know that we have intelligence committees that sit in parliament. Imagine you are a member of our uh, uh, interior defense committees. And you are a Ghanaian Togolese. And there is intelligence about terrorist activities or matters to do with intelligence that deal with Ghana and Togo. You'll be conflicted? You'll be conflicted. You'll be conflicted. You understand? You can't, you cannot, there are sensitive things that come before. But there are times when Parliament sits in, in conclave right. without, because of security implications. You can actually become a minister. Imagine your national security minister being a Ghanaian and, let's say, a citizen of another country. That is dangerous. <laughs> you understand? So for that, I would restrict, I would, I would advocate a restriction as it is. What I would probably propose is that maybe because of, let's say, you are, you are a citizen of another country and it ties with your work that you do there. And so there are some benefits that you enjoy as a dual citizen. If you stand for the election, and some of them are good professionals that we can benefit from. So if the person actually wins the election, not the primaries, if he wins the election itself, we should give the person time to renounce. Because obviously, the primary election is a gamble. Mm. The election itself is a gamble. But if you win, then we say that maybe before you, you take the oath, or within maybe three months or four months, depending on the the maybe the the administrative processes that you must go through to renounce the citizenship. You understand? It may require that what you uh, 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 be allowed to go through the process after you have won. So just maybe six months or something, you are required once you take the oath to renounce the citizenship. Very so well. as to uh, get, give us the opportunity to get quality material too from the diaspora. Right. Lawyer Aban, your take on this in, in your concluding, in, as you're concluding. Thank you. You, you. you realize that in the case of the president, he must be a Ghanaian by birth. By birth, yeah. Why is it that it should, that uh, would not also be open to anybody uh, dual citizen to uh, become president? Mm. So there is something to be said for those restrictions. And I can assure you, with the kind of politics the way we do it, you realize that all it takes is for somebody to go to America, go and work and make some money. He jumps into his, uh, uh, I mean, the, the land of his birth, uh, let, let's say his constituency. And you know, we cannot run away from it. He buys the thing. 
tomorrow he's in parliament. Mm. After four years or five, uh, ten years or eight years, when things are not uh, going anywhere, he, I mean, goes back. He, he goes back. I think there is something to be said for mm. those restrictions, so that at least mm. we can have people who would also devote their time to serve Ghana, right? And so they should also be given that kind of uh, 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 leverage. Very well. So Franklin, you have one minute. I'll give Martin the last word. Franklin, you have one minute. I, I'm not sure um, I'm, I'm going to say anything significantly different from what I said earlier. Um, let the court processes go on and then uh, but as, as a much bigger uh, issue is how to move away from this uh, rather difficult, if you like, uh, unnecessary uh, restrictions on citizens who want to serve their country. Very well. I guess we need to move on, really. Very well. Martin, uh, um, Franklin said we need to move on. Professor Zion could think we need to move on and, and open it up. Very brilliant submission from your two colleagues. What do you think in respect of the restrictions placed on dual citizens? The, for the larger gamut of all the restrictions, uh, it's not a straight answer. It depends. You see, some of the offices, as needs referred to, are very sensitive. So we cannot just do a wholesale uh, upliftment of the restrictions. Maybe in certain areas, we will, we will lift the restrictions. In others, they may stay. You say, yes, that's what I think. Middle, at least it's middle of the road. Mm -hmm. And then coming to the specifics of Honorable uh, Kwesin's case, J.T. Kwesin's case, I think that that should be also one of the areas of the amendment. To the extent that at least his renunciation certificate came, <coughs> excuse me, before, before the, election. the elections, mm -hmm. I think that was a case in which we could save his election instead of going back for a rerun. Mm. We, we are wasting money. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, around the table, I had Martin Pebu, uh, legal practitioner director of the Human Rights and, and Governance Center, uh, Fra Franklin Kujo, President of Money Africa, who was on Zoom, uh, the Honorable Alex Anda Aban, private legal practitioner, former member of parliament, uh, Nick Paco Samwa, a private legal practitioner and a member of the NDC. Uh, this is how we conclude today's edition of the program. Uh, my name is Selom Adunu. The show has been produced by Fred Jabano and Kojo Ajiman. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>